Follow the Parliament of Trinidad and Tobago on Twitter. Our call sign is at TT Parliament. General. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I, I, I won't comment on the opposition numbers standing at two. Um, Madam Speaker, I beg to move that a bill entitled An Act to Amend the Motor Vehicles and Road Traffic Act, Chapter 4850, be now read a second time. Madam Speaker, it gives me great pleasure to pilot this particular amendment to the Motor Vehicle and Road Traffic Act, Chapter 4850. And so important a concern is it for the people of Trinidad and Tobago that in fact we agreed to stop the last debate that we were on so that we could treat with this because it's high time that we now communicate the deliberations of the government relative to the speed at which our nation's roads um, can move, the, the, the persons using the road can move, mm. and actually Treat with it in both houses. You see, Madam Speaker, people may very well ask, why is it that the speed limit can't just be applied by way of a simple change? And many people, in fact, in Trinidad and Tobago said, but you all changed the speed limit recently, and you didn't have to go to Parliament. Well, the truth is, Madam Speaker, that Trinidad and Tobago did not have a government that changed the speed limit to 80 kilometers per hour or 50 kilometers per hour in outside built up areas and in inside built up areas. What we did is we applied the law. And in applying the law, we took use of technology permitted under sections 61 onward, 62 onward from the Motor Vehicle and Road Traffic Act and we just simply applied the law. And very interestingly, in Trinidad and Tobago, that conversation happened as to whether culture should change law or whether law should change culture. And in the imposition of the law, in holding the law fast and saying that we will apply the existing speed limit, Trinidad and Tobago saw the operationalization of technology in 2016, which allowed us to reduce the nation's speed. In fact, it was a very difficult exercise for many people, Madam Speaker. People complained bitterly that Trinidad and Tobago was now left in a position where the speed was too slow. People complained about 
getting to work and taking extra time. But in Trinidad and Tobago, Madam Speaker, we had a successful experience. And that was, if you have the appropriate sanctions in law, you can change culture. And the speed gun implementation is really testimony to that. It's also evidence of the need in other laws where we seek to apply appropriate sanctions to errant activity or criminal activity or activity which is intended to be restrained. And the conversation is now in applying the laws in an effective manner. Madam Speaker, this bill before us is a very simple bill, but it took a while to take us to this point, and permit me to explain why. So the bill before us is simply to provide for enforcement of new maximum speed limits on specified, specified classes of motor vehicles outside and within built-up areas, and it can also allow the Minister to amend a schedule to the Act by order subject to negative resolution of Parliament. <coughs> it's literally two clauses long, but it belies the amount of work that it took to come here. Now, Madam Speaker, I want to say this. Trinidad and Tobago experimented with the exercise of perfection. As it relates to our motor vehicle and traffic laws, road traffic laws, we for far too long embarked upon a journey of trying to come up with a perfect law. In fact, in the last um, government's tenure, there was an exercise which was uncompleted. What this government said is that we will treat with the laws step by step, layer by layer if necessary, because the parliament is there to do work as it is moved. But in treating with road traffic, offenses in particular, what we have done is to say to Trinidad and Tobago that we consider motor vehicle and road traffic legislation and the application of the law to be directly involved in the fight against crime. That's why we came with a motor vehicle and road traffic amendment to the laws which introduced red light cameras, which introduced demerit point system, which introduced significant reforms into the way in which we treated with ourselves, in particular for the utilization of courts where we decriminalized the traffic offenses into traffic violations. And by doing that, Madam Speaker, we have come now on a second step. The current law, Madam Speaker, which really can explain why we are here doing what we're doing, um, is to be found at section 62 of the Motor Vehicle and Road Traffic Act. That's chapter 58, 4850. And permit me to explain it by actually reading the two of the clause. It comes under part five, which is driving and other offenses and general conditions relating to the use of roads. Section 62 reads as follows. Subsection one. Subject as herein after provided, it shall not be lawful for any person to drive a motor vehicle of any class or description on any road, A, outside of a built up area at a speed greater than a speed specified in the second schedule, and it goes on, B, within a built-up area at a speed greater than the speed specified in the second schedule. C, whether outside or within a built-up area in respect of a special speed imposed at a speed exceeding the special speed imposed in relation to the vehicle of that class or description. So section 62 says you can't drive on the laws of Trinidad and Tobago prescribing a limit set out in section 2, 62, which is tied into the schedule. We go on to say in subsection 2, the minister may by order impose special speed limits with respect to any road, whether outside or within a built-up area or any part of a road in relation to <coughs> motor vehicles generally, etc. Then we go on in section 62 to treat with the chief technical officer having a role and function within the estimation of what a special speed limit should be and we then go down, any person who drives a motor vehicle on any road in contravention is liable to fine a $4,000 and to be disqualified from holding a driver's permit. And then we provide a defense, saying that it shall be a good defense for a person who basically broke, broke the law, that he didn't know of the circumstances of that road being prescribed in the very careful language in subsection 5. Madam Speaker, when we come down to subsection 7 of this particular clause, it says this, Subject to affirmative resolution of Parliament, the President 
may by regulation amend the second schedule. Let me repeat that. The subject to the um, affirmative resolution of the parliament, the president may by regulation amend the second schedule. Now, president is read as cabinet, as interpreted by law, but to treat with the matters in the second schedule, and Madam Speaker, those matters in the second schedule are as follows. There are set out the parameters of the second schedule. Speed limits is what it's called. On the left-hand column, you deal with the class or description of vehicle, and it sets out from A to G the particular types, tractors, vehicles with trays, goods vehicles which exceed 2,500 kilograms, goods vehicles which do not exceed 2,500 kilograms, private motor cars with, tra with trailers, and any other motor car. But the law in the second schedule, in the right-hand column, tells you that for any vehicle, basically 80 kilometers per hour, outside a built-up area, and within a built-up area, 50. And if you are treating with a bus, you're looking at 65 outside a built-up area and 50 within a built-up area. And if you're treating with those class of cars, which are 2,500 kilograms, just over that 2,500 kilograms, it's at 65 kilometers outside a built-up area and 50 kilometers within a built-up area. Let's translate that into simplicity now. Section 62 of the current law in subclause 7 says that if you want to change the speed limit set out in the second schedule, you have to move the parliament, have a debate on this by way of affirmative resolution to amend the schedule. Madam Speaker, this law came about pre-1962. This law, in fact, um, has been around for almost 100 years. This law became law. This is Act Number 42 of 1934. And there was an ordinance before that. That's why I come up with the 100 years. But in 1969, when these laws were being treated with, the speed limits were cast. And in 1969, the road conditions were very different. The number of vehicles on the road, the engineering specifications of road, they were very different. In fact, Madam Speaker, in 1969, the main traversing roads were the minor roads as we now use them on the Carney Savannah Road, the Southern Main Road, etc. I recall vividly my grandfather telling me the story of going from Tableland, where he was born, to Port of Spain on the back of a donkey cart along those roads and the days it would take to get to Port of Spain along those same roads. But the laws as cast right now, designed in 1969, prescribed that Parliament should move itself to amend speed limits. So the average citizen may not know that the law is as archaic as that. And that the law really requires the Parliament to be involved in something which, quite frankly, should be left to the technical engineering specific divisions of the Ministry of Works and Transport for recommendation to a cabinet based upon evidence within the context of Section 62 of the Motor Vehicle and Road Traffic Act so that you don't disturb Parliament for this. What this bill proposes is that Parliament is now invited to amend the parent law, change 62 sub clause 7, remove it from affirmative resolution amendment to the second schedule, which is the speed limits. Instead, allow for the minister to have an order published, which is then subject to negative resolution. That way, parliament scrutiny is not removed. It is open to a member once the order is published within 42 days of the actual sitting time calculation that parliament does to bring a motion to negative the order. Now, Madam Speaker, the truth is, to conduct the review of this law, to change the speed limit, there was a very complicated exercise that had to be performed by the Ministry of Works and Transport. And what was that? The definition of built-up area defined in the Act says it's Port of Spain, it's San Fernando, those two cities, or it is the borough of Arima. And it is any other place that may by order be prescribed to be a built-up area. Everything else 
is considered outside a built-up area. But Madam Speaker, you know that in 1969, we didn't have the Churchill Roosevelt Highway the way we have Uriah Butler Highway. We didn't have the Claude Noel Highway. We didn't have the Curtin Rienzi Highway. We didn't have the Diego Martin Highway. We didn't have the large arteries that we now have were not in existence nor designed in the manner that they are now. Indeed, in the period 1969 to date, we've had road widening. We've had improved um, security features onto the roads. We've introduced the New Jersey um, rail barrier system, the thermoplastic um, guides for um, line identification and markers. We've put in the railing system. We now have a system of interchanges and flyovers so that you're no longer rushing to a red light to then cross. And what we have had happen is a development from an engineering perspective which makes the roads of Trinidad and Tobago difficult to map out from what is inside a built-up area to what is outside a built-up area. And the engineering division and the Ministry of Works and Transport had to physically go and visit all of our roads, primary and secondary, and all of our ramps along primary and secondary roads, and come with a redefinition of what a built-up area is and what a non-built-up area is in the form of orders to be issued by the minister as the parent law is amended. So, Madam Speaker, to change the speed limit, we had to specifically look to the engineering ca categorization of the highways and then decide, well, where does a built-up area actually go? Because we had this anomaly where you are passing, for instance, Shaguanas, or you are passing um, on your way to Kuva, or you are passing where the interchanges now exist at Grand Bazaar or elsewhere, and you would have to go through this exercise of speeding up and then slowing down and then speeding up and slowing down as you began to intersect between built up and not built up within the definitions of law. And it made a nonsense for the application of law. So what we have done, Madam Speaker, we're proposing for the Parliament to consider the amendment of the second schedule. We're proposing that the second schedule henceforth only be done by way of order subject to negative resolution. And then we shall be issuing notices, orders, which speak to special limits under the minister's hand. And those special limits will be contained in the prescriptive speeds on the ramps, every single ramp in Trinidad and Tobago, and also how we treat with the merger in coming into ramps. So we now define in law that, and this will come by way of a combination between the parent law and the orders, we are now going to define that built up areas that everywhere in Trinidad and Tobago is a built up area except those which we now list as non-built up areas. So we've simplified the law. We have taken the task to literally go through each and every road in Trinidad and Tobago. We have mapped out each and every ramp in <coughs> Trinidad and Tobago. And I'd like to say this to the good people of Tobago. Tobago was dealt with in 1969 and in 1979 when there were amendments to the law, such that you could not drive at a speed beyond 50 kilometers per hour, if I'm, if I'm correct, as I look to the technocrats um, who are in the parliament chamber as well. So there's a discrimination between the laws of Tobago as, I, as they apply in Tobago and the laws in Trinidad and Tobago, notwithstanding the fact that you have a highway in Tobago as well. So what we are proposing specifically now in relation to this, if we look to clause two of the bill, we're proposing that amendment, that section 62.7, you delete affirmative resolution of parliament, the president made by regulation, you substitute it with negative resolution of parliament, the minister made by order. We are now proposing specifically that the second schedule be amended in two very important ways. One, by taking account of the modern engineering and utilization of a particular class of cars. T vehicles, which are used for private purposes, SUVs in particular, are now engineered to be very different 
from the Buick and Ford types of trucks which existed in 1969 and 1979. These have now become passenger cars within the meaning of motor vehicles, but their tear weight is at a sum higher than 2,500. They are in fact at 3,200. And what we have sought to do is to now provide in the law the acknowledgement that these SUVs will no longer be bound to drive at 65 kilometers per hour. They will be allowed to join the class of other vehicles that can drive at 100 kilometers per hour as we now seek to make that amendment. And why? We're doing that because the platonic movement of cars on our nation's roads have to be factored. If you have in a system of traffic a standard vehicle, and SUV, moving at 65 on a two-lane highway, you're going to slow down the entire platonic movement of the cars. And therefore, in the modality to make sure that we make sense of the law and move vehicles at a correct pace, uh, at whether it is 1,200 cars per hour passing at a particular point or not, some other figure, you have to factor what is referred to in engineering terms as the platonic movement of the traffic flow. So that's the first area inside of the amendment of the second schedule that bites. All of these SUVs are 3,200 kilograms. These will now be accepted from the pickups, um, Hiluxes, all of these common vehicles on the road right now, very um, Nissan Navara, whatever the car may be. These are now in the class of ordinary vehicles which will be permitted to travel at the speed limit of 100 kilometers per hour. Very good, very good. Outside of built-up areas, and if you're in a built-up area, it's 50 kilometers per hour. The second thing that we do is what I just referred to. We change the speed limits. And what we're doing in the amendment to the second schedule is we are seeking to change the speed limit instead of 65 kilometers per hour, we're going to 100 kilometers per hour. That's for the um, 3,200 um, kilogram vehicles, the, the pickups, etc. And instead of 80 kilometers per hour for ordinary vehicles, you can now move at 100 kilometers per hour. I wish to caution the good people of Trinidad and Tobago that merely discussing this in the parliament does not make it a fait accompli because it must pass this law through the House of Representatives, then to the Senate, after the Senate, we must then have His Excellency the President assent to the law and it becomes part of the laws of Trinidad and Tobago. And that's why we stopped the last bill. We stopped the last bill so that we could deal with this matter now because people are anxious about it. But Madam Speaker, I want to tuck this into the context of the work that we've done. It's very important to note that in the government's view, we consider use of the roads to be directly related to national security. People commit crimes and hardly ever make their escape in a donkey cart. People commit their crimes and most usually jump into a stolen vehicle or some people brazen enough to just use their own. What we have done, yes, and, and there are other ways, what we have done, Madam Speaker, in tightening the noose on the, use to, on the utilization of roads, in particular in the last set of amendments we did to the Motor Vehicle and Road Traffic Act. What we have done in relation to that and in the introduction of the measures that we have for red light camera enforcement, for decriminalization offenses to violations, for the uh, movement into the demerit point system, in doing that, we freed up the courts, taken 100,000 cases out, but passing a law and operationalizing a law is two different things. So I'd like to just touch very quickly on the fact of where we are on operationalization. There, were, there was massive effort done, and I wish to pay an open compliment to the very hardworking people at the Ministry of Works and Transport. I mean, they have really extended themselves beyond belief into an area of performance that I think is admirable. Secondly, the Judiciary of Trinidad and Tobago, the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service, the Office of the Attorney General, the public servants and members that work there, and the Traffic Management Bank uh, branch, and the IT systems of government. Because I'm very pleased to say, 
for the provision of driver's permit via centralized computer system, which obviously you have to have if you're going to use demerits, etc. I can tell you that's completed. For the implementation of a data center for hosting licensing electronic system database, that is completed. For the modification of forms, driver's permit transactions, vehicle registration <coughs> transactions, we estimate to complete that by December 2017. For the online application request for driver's permits and renewals, that will be done by February 2018. Data sharing with the police is completed. Implementation of computerized vehicle registration system, completed. Online access to basic vehicle records, which you're going to have to have the police have access to and licensing officers have access to, completed. Printing of certified copies at all licensing sites, that's earmarked at four sites already completed, but the full gamut will be completed December of this year. Printing of certified copies at TT Post, because getting your certified copies and the quote-unquote allegations of corruption involved in that, that is to be dealt with by a TT Post printing aspect that is earmarked for March of 2018. Vehicle pre-inspection port at the licensing authority at uh, Frederick Settlement, completed. Electronic ticket system handheld device enforcement officers, we estimate April 2018. Data sharing with the police on a real-time basis, again, completed. What does this mean? This system of putting electronic information available is to be married with a very important improvement which is coming, which is the ability to pay online, which is the ability to be cashless in the licensing authority and, as you will see soon enough, in the Registrar General's department. By moving into a cashless environment, by putting the structures of implementation for data management we are well on our way to operationalizing the Motor Vehicle and Road Traffic Act so that we can have the effect of removing 100,000 cases from the courts. We can have the effect of having the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service better able to perform their core functions, which is to treat with crime, as opposed to turning up in court 100% of the time to have 30% product. Because that's what happens. They go to court every time as their witnesses are required to be there 100% of the time, and we get 30% enforcement. So, Madam Speaker, this law has been carefully thought out. It is born on the back of a significant improvement in the statistics of road deaths in Trinidad and Tobago. I want to compliment openly again the partnership that has flourished between private sector interest groups, non-profit non organizations, Arrive Alive in particular, and the unstinting, undaunting efforts of Sharon Inglefield in particular, and many other agencies of this type, with the Ministry of Works and Transport, in the exercise of ensuring that safety returns to our roads. Madam Speaker, when we look to the carnage on the roads, we have seen an 8% reduction year on year, a 12% reduction year on year. We have seen the TTPS note that the fatalities uh, and, and, and incidences of, of injury and maiming and not, not death but just as bad as death, that these have all climbed down. If our roads are managed in a lawful fashion, it's a signal to the world and to ourselves that we are becoming more disciplined. Improving structures is critical. Thinking our way in successive steps with important, albeit sometimes apparently small adjustments, this is what makes the difference to our country. I genuinely believe that this bill is well intended and that honorable members should not have too much difficulty um, speaking to support for the bill. I do look forward to any observations that honorable members may have on this, and I beg to move. Honourable Members, I shall now propose a question for debate. The question is that a bill entitled An Act to Amend the Motor Vehicles and Road Traffic Act, Chapter 4850, be now read a second time. Member for Tabakit. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker, and I'm very, very uh, pleased to join this debate, and I want to also join the 
Attorney General and Member for San Fernando West in congratulating the divisions of the Ministry of Works. I had the honor and privilege of working alongside the legal department at the Ministry of Works and also the traffic div division of the Ministry of Works. And I would like to openly say that in my view, they are one of the great examples of professionalism in the public service from which other people can learn about commitment and duty and responsibility, especially in an area that involves lives. And I really, really, it was one of the, one of the areas in the ministry I worked that I, I really enjoyed working with, with, um, with that, that group of um, staff. Madam Speaker, the Honorable Minister said that several things were done, including computerization of data records of vehicles and so on. Minister, it will surprise you to know, though, that I called the licensing office um, in Karani to get the number of vehicles on the road for this debate. I wanted to find exactly how many vehicles are on the road. And all they could tell me it is about 900,000 vehicles on the road. Now, that doesn't tell me much because I remember when I left office, it was just about 777,000 vehicles on the road. And I remember there was a gentleman by the name of Adandi Pickett at, at the ministry who would give me the exact figures. Now, if you computerize and you say that the computerization is complete and so efficient, then you will be able to get uh, you know, how many um, vehicles on the road. And I ask another question, which I thought was a very important question. How many pe persons in this country are, regist are, are licensed drivers? In other words, how many driving uh, permits exist in the country? And all I was, I was told is over a million. Now, again, <laughs> that doesn't satisfy why I was asking the question, because I was trying to do an analysis of the age group of people, because there, there is um, a problem in this country which I believe has to be addressed, which is um, how young people are treating vehicles. You see, in my view, a vehicle is a weapon in the hands of a person. And um, if it's mistreated, then you can have a situation that occurred on the Pinal Rock Road where two children are to the left um, without parents. And um, you know, it's very sad to know that they'll be separated also. So it, it, you can have some very um, deep emotional scars as a result of recklessness on the road. In fact, Madam Speaker, you know, I'd like to say that recklessness is a species of crime and should be regarded on our streets and should be so regarded on our streets and highways. It is recklessness, recklessness, recklessness is a species of crime. And we must not be afraid to regard it and, and take the, the action that we need to take in order to deal with it. Madam Speaker, there are two kinds of decisions that are generally made by government. One, decisions that are and should be made on the basis of fact and research. And the fact and research might result in having to make a decision that is not popular, but yet it should be made. And the mark of good governance is always to make decisions that are not popular, but which is in the interest of promoting a better society in the future, a society that will have order and a society in which there will be respect and regard. And the second kind of decision is a decision that are just based on popularism. I want to be popular. It is politically correct to do it, while it might be very wrong otherwise. What the people want is what I will give to them, but it will not necessarily be the most useful option. And one has to be careful when one makes popular decisions which are not supported by facts. Because I think it's very important in the history of our country, be it in our economics, be it wherever we are in the development cycle, that we begin to make decisions that are based upon facts and based upon research. In other words, policy formulation should, in my view, always have a proper basis in research, both qualitative and quantitative. And this decision to review the speed limit appears to be a popular decision, a populist decision. This is what the people want. This is what the people have been crying out for. The people say you can't drive at 80 um, kilometers an hour. It's causing problems and what have you. And the minister, you know, I would have expected that the minister would have presented some research to show why 100 kilometers an hour is a better or worse option. Now, this doesn't mean to say that I'm not going to uh, be in support of, of, of the changes to be made. But I think that, you know, 
we have to be very careful because one of the questions have to be asked in this country is, have our roads been designed to accommodate this additional speed? Engineer. Yeah, in engineering aspects, have our roads really been designed for that? It may, it may be, it may be. But I, I, I need to ask that question and put it on the table because in, in the built up areas, the Honorable Minister has spoken about 50 kilometers an hour. And a lot of those um, roads in the built up areas are also very narrow. And they have not been widened because of how people have built their homes and where the drains and so on. And while town and country planning, for example, will tell you that it must be at least six, kilometer, six um, meters wide, a lot of those roads are about five meters or even less and presents very great difficulty. So you, I, that, that's something I think that has to be looked at. Now, Madam Speaker, let us, let us agree, let us agree that driving habits have a lot to be desired in this country. A lot to be desired. Madam Speaker, you know, there are, there are all kinds of issues uh, that come about because of traffic congestion, including road rage, anger, disrespect for the laws um, that regulate traffic, and so on. But in my view, people are driving very badly in this country. Very badly. They're driving without respect, Madam Speaker. And I think that it is something that is contributing to road fatalities. And even though road fatalities have declined, and in 2016, there were only 135 fatalities compared to 2006 and 7. In both years, there were 214 each. And in 2008, as high as 262. It is from 2011 that you found that it went down below, under 200 and has steadily declined every year, and 2016 was 135. And, you know, I find that to be a very important positive development. But every life lost on our roads is, is more than a life. It is, it is a human resource. It is an, an asset. And we have lost some, some very, very well-educated people well-skilled people in this country, sometimes not because of, of any fault on their part, but because of the atrocious driving habits um, of others. And I think that is something that, that we have to look at. You know, Madam Speaker, it gives me no pleasure to, to, to say this, for example. Last night, I'm driving up the highway from south every night. I, I leave Faisabad at 6, 6.30, and I'm coming up the highway in the vicinity of Claxton Bay. And there's this truck, and all I'm seeing is a silhouette because the, the, the lights on the road, uh, Mr. Minister, wasn't working also, the, the street lights. So you're seeing a silhouette, very dirty truck when you got up to it. So I got up about 60 feet behind this truck and I suddenly realized there was a truck in front of me. The lights at the back is not working. It is so dirty that not even the, the red um, piece <laughs> reflectors are, are showing. And the truck number is TBG 2309, belonging to a company called BK, when I passed the truck, BK. And that, that, that is a truck in, in Freeport. And Madam Speaker, you know, I could have run into the back of that truck. Somebody could run into the back of that truck. And, and I, I have no disrespect for the owners of the company, but I say this publicly because I think it's time we begin to speak publicly and, and, and back up what we are saying by not being afraid to call names and to name and shame people who are do, allowing these things to happen. Of course, I called the company this morning and spoke to the secretary. Madam Speaker, this morning also, at six, six, uh, about 6.15 or 6.30 on the road, I'm going south again. And in the vicinity of the Divine Life Society, here comes a panel van owned by Amalgamated Security. Black smoke emanating from this vehicle. And the vehicle is at a tremendous speed going down the, the, the highway. I decided that if I had to break the law, I wanted to see how fast that vehicle was driving. I had to drive at 150 kilometers to pick up the vehicle after the vehicle passed me. And I picked up the vehicle way down past the court Sam place um, on, on the highway. Amalgamated security. And Mr. Minister, I want to say something. Not because amalgamated security is transporting um, prisoners on the road, do they have the right to abuse the roadways and to abuse others on the road. And I'm saying that they are doing that on a very frequent basis. They were not transporting prisoners this morning because that was one single vehicle. But that's what I mean by the kind of abuse of, of, of privilege on the roads. And, and under the cover of, of uh, having the transport prisoners, every day it is a battle. It is a battle. A battle together. You have in the night time, police vehicles are, tra are, are, are guiding trucks that are wider than, the, than half of the road. The trucks have no lights on the side of the road. So you are coming from the other side on a dark road on Mosquito Creek. 
and the member for Faisalabad will tell you. And you, you have to pull aside on the grass to let them go. And they are traveling at more than the speed that they should be traveling. I see Jusamco trucks on the M2 ring road. And when I speak to the drivers of the trucks, I say, why are you breaking at the woodland crossover there and not waiting? They say, well, we have a certain number of trips to make for the day. And therefore, they are driving at breakneck speed. So I, I think it's important that while we deal with, with speed, we also have a, very, a more vigilant police service that is not only there with the cameras to pick up people in, um, in, in, in the dust dark at um, Golconda and outside um, C3, but they're also dealing with these kinds of things that are happening on the roads. And I think it's very important that I bring this to the attention of, of the parliament. Madam Speaker, while we debate, therefore, this popularist decision in order to reduce what I believe the government wants to reduce, public and political dissonance, we have to be aware that this move could, could also increase the risk of accidents. But there is something interesting um, in the state of uh, British Columbia. When the government there raised their rural highway speed from 90 kilometers an hour to 100 kilometers an hour, there was actually an 18% decrease in serious collisions. So strange as it seems, getting drivers to pick up the pace might actually make everyone a little safer. And that's the point I think the member for San Fernando West and the Attorney General is making. Because you can have vehicles driving at a faster speed and vehicles driving at a slower speed, and then you get a kind of confusion. And you might actually end up having more traffic jam mm -hmm. in that way. So that um, normalizing and standardizing the, the, the speed limit could be a good thing. But at the same time, um, we need to think we need to think the, uh, about the effects and whether, in fact, um, well, in the autobahn, there are hardly any accidents yeah, yeah. And, and so on. So maybe speed, maybe speed doesn't kill. But having said that, I think it's important to note that speed can be and is deadly. And some of the worst accidents in this country and the deaths we have had have been due, due to speed. For example, the research is showing that at 100 kilometers per hour, it is 16 times worse than an impact at 25 kilometers an hour. 16 times worse. Breakneck speed. And uh, the autobahn was just referred to, and that's a fam famous roadway in Germany that has no speed limit uh, throughout some of its sections. And one will think that is a death trap. But in Germany, the death rate from accidents is 6.9 per 1,000 cars for 1,000 cars. So you have to, with, with that in mind, you might look for other factors, lack of driving skill, um, car safety and quality, and environmental conditions and so on as bad weather. So having said all of this, the causes of accidents and sometimes fatal ones are also due to matters that are within the control, control of ministers and of governments and of people who work in those, those ministries. For example, potholes and poor road surfaces. Madam Speaker, potholes have been known to cause serious accidents and death by accident. And right now, Mr. Minister of Works, there is a serious, serious problem on Mosquito Creek. Mosquito Creek. There are potholes there that can cause death. And I'm saying that without reservation. And if any one of the ministers on the other side would like to go and travel on Mosquito Creek and see what I'm talking about in the night when there are no lights also, because the lights on the creek are not working, you will begin to understand. Labrit travels there. She would understand what I'm saying. It is, it is an obstacle course. So sometimes you could be pulling on the traffic or pulling on the, onto the wall um, that, that borders the sea. So potholes and poor road surfaces. Secondly, another cause of accident is this matter of poor drainage at the sides of roads and so on. Now, I remember in the very old days, the 60s, 70s, even parts of the 80s, you would have people from the Ministry of Works, they will be going along the road and they will be cutting channels at the edge of the road in order to let the water out. And sometimes you would have found that um, backhoes will come and they'll scrape up the um, accumulation of, of silt along the side of the roads so that the water does not stay on the road. Because sometimes you can hit water and you actually run off the road. And right now we are seeing a lot of that 
in a lot of places um, in Trinidad, the accumulation of water making for very hazardous conditions. And there's also the matter of poor signage, for example, around um, corners. Only after several persons lost their lives on the M2 ring road from Golconda going into Debi, did you have an intervention by um, the Ministry of Works, I believe, who came and they scored the road. And since then, you really not had um, problems arising in that particular area. So that is something that has to be done in other areas of Trinidad. You have to identify where you need to score the roads. And, and to do the Lady Young Road also, um, I think was scored recently also, and that's something. And I, I spoke about the poorly lit wide body, wide body vehicles transporting equipment at night on poorly lit roads. And then I come to a very, a very um, disturbing thing. The, I, the whole thing about corruption at the um, licensing office. Madam Speaker, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Eh? I had to have a tea vehicle um, check for inspection last year. And up to December, I couldn't get, get in. So I went, I paid my $300 to get the inspection done. And I went one day and I, I stood in the line from 7 o'clock to 11 o'clock in the morning. And then realized it wouldn't be done because the licensing office is closing up at 12 o'clock because the air condition system is not working in San Fernando. All right. So I go back the next morning. I go earlier this time. So I'm now 8 in line or 9 in line. And I'm still waiting for about an hour and a half. And up comes a guy to me. And I, I see he took a piece of cloth and he rubbed off on my um, chassis to see what is the chassis number of the vehicle. So having done that, another guy comes and he says, um, boss, what are you doing in this line? Um, look, $700 and we, you don't have to stay here, you know. 400 for, for the licensing, us, licensing people, 300 for me. I'm telling you. Madam Speaker, I could give you privately a telephone number to call in point four ten, where somebody will tell you how to do that. Because after that, I began to check the system. And that is what is happening. So there are vehicles on the roads that have not been properly examined by the licensing authority and the transport um, commissioner and so on that might be very defective on the roads of Trinidad. And I would say there are hundreds of vehicles that have not been inspected at all. And they are not being stopped by the police um, at, at the rate I think they should be stopped. Now, this is public safety. And we, we need to do something about the, about, about the safety of people. Of course, I just want to let the minister know I, I got my, my inspection certificate, but I haven't got the sticker for the vehicle up to now. So my vehicle doesn't have any, any um, sticker. And whenever they, they stop me, I have to take all the certificate from the and show it that I have I've done the inspection and, and, and what have you and, and so on. But what I also find is very disturbing, Madam Speaker, is the kind of inspection done. Madam Speaker, you go over the pit and the they don't even go under the vehicle. And they then tell you, drive and pull up the handbrakes and stop. And that's the inspection. Now, Prime Minister. And you, well, you don't pay. You, you, you know, you go. But if you don't want to go, to, but all over, taxi drivers will tell you that they, 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 they don't even carry their vehicles for inspection. And they get it done by paying $300, $400. It's corrupt. But the cost of that corruption is life. That is my point. Life. And that is an economic cost also um, to, to the country. So I think that, that we have to do something about that. Now, the other matter is this. We have licensed a number of um, garages to do inspections. We have licensed them. We have private vehicles that are five years and older must be inspected every two years. How many of these vehicles have been inspected? The, the, the people tell you they don't have stickers to put on, on those vehicles. And then I, there's another question I have to ask. What kind of quality control is, um, is done on these licensed garages to ensure that the inspectors are qualified and competent? What kind of quality control is done on these garages? When last have these garages been inspected to see whether you know, they are carrying through the 64 point or 75 point inspection as they need to, to, to carry it out. Madam Speaker, this is not about winning any votes at all, this debate. This is about saving lives. Saving lives. And I am not interested in getting a vote. I'm interested in saving a life. I'm interested here today in what is right for the country. 
Madam Speaker, you know, there are all kinds of reasons why people um, want to drive fast. You know, some people tell you they have to drive fast in the morning to get into town to get a park. Yes, to get a park. They have to drive um, early, especially. My daughter works at a legal firm in Paul's in Polony, and, Blanc, and she leaves home every morning between 5 and 5.15 to get to work, to make sure that she could get to work for 8 o'clock. If she doesn't leave that time, and she leaves any time like 6, it's trouble. She's going to get to work after 6. No, after, yeah, after 8, sorry. Yeah. And, so, and there are thousands of persons. And therefore, while we deal with the speed limit, and increasing the speed limit and so on, we have to think about other, other matters. We have to think about how we reduce frustration. We talk about productivity in the country, but we might be able to get more productivity if we can use innovative means to get people to work. For example, but, um, removing a lot of what people have to do in Port of Spain to other centers um, in, 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 the, in the country, uh, so, yeah, to building the administrative centers and make them not only administrative centers for the regional corporations, but in order to offer a range of services also um, to people so that people don't have to come into Port of Spain to do everything. People can work closer to their homes and what have you. So while we talk about traffic, we have to talk about the whole reorganization of, of the society and how we, how, how we, get, things, how we get things done. Um, Madam Speaker, the problem with the increased speed limit. Now, it is said that the best fuel economy you can have is to drive between 50 and 55 miles an hour, right? Now, faster driving means you're going to consume more fuel. And more fuel means more pollution. And therefore, there's the whole question of the environmental responsibility with respect to this whole matter of raising the, the, the speed limit. Now, I'm not saying don't do it. I mean, in, in everything in, in society, you have to have self-discipline and self-restraint. You must have that. Otherwise, a society cannot operate. A society cannot only operate by laws. You know, people must have self-discipline, and there must be self-restraint. So with higher, um, with, with higher uh, speeds, you are going to get a, a higher consumption of fuel, but the fuel prices has, have gone up, so maybe that will um, <laughs> cause people to drive slower. Or maybe this will be an incentive for people to go and buy the hybrid vehicles like they're supposed um, to, to buy um, in, the, in, in the country. And in any case, um, undo some of the pollution that is taking place with, with the diesel. But I would really like the environmental police to come back on the streets and do what they have to do and pull some of these vehicles um, off the road that are polluting. Now, there's one matter that I, I want to raise as we talk about the, um, the, the, the fuel and, and the speed. And it relates to... Um, to taxis. Now, in the budget debate, of course, hybrids above 1599, you raised um, the, 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 the taxes and so on. But also, you have raised the taxes on other vehicles, seven seaters, that are used by, by taxis. And that's going to come into effect sometime in January. So, in a, in a, in a country in which there's great difficulty getting a, a, an efficient public transport service, you know, you're, you're running the risk of penalizing people who are able to run these seven-seaters, and now they have to pay at least, from what I understand, about $25,000 more in taxes for one of those vehicles. And um, that means that the, the public uh, you know, might be further burdened by an increase in the um, cost of, of, of transport. So, Madam Speaker, that is just one matter that I wanted to raise. Um, the other matter is... Of course, we talked about it, the severity of accidents, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, the cost to the health system of accidents is, is very, very big. Very, very big in this country. Permanent disability of people. Loss of human resources. But Madam Speaker, how many accidents occur as a result of vehicle failure versus driver error? Madam Speaker, I have advocated, and I want to do so again today very respectfully, that nobody should be put on the streets to drive unless they have done a defensive driving course. A defensive driving course. I will go further to advocate that persons who have just gotten their licenses, at least for one year, 
they should be driving in the company of somebody who is who has a, a vehicle and who has a license for at least um, three years, so that they can be mentored on the roads. You know, we talk about mentoring, but mentoring is not only something we do for careers. Mentoring has to be done also in so many other aspects um, of, of our society. So the vehicle failure, to, in my view, is less, and less a cause of the accidents than, than speed. And driver error, driver error seems to be the big, the big thing um, that is causing, that is, could be the cause of um, so many of the accidents that are taking um, place. The, the, the Honorable Attorney General made a very good point about slow versus fast. People going too slow um, on the outside lane and causing traffic uh, buildup. Let's hope that you know, the people, you know, if they want to drive under the 100, they should be staying on the inner lane and not on the outer lane. But having spoken about all this and having raised the point that why people have to drive at breakneck speed in order to get to work in the morning or to beat the traffic and to get a park and so on, it raises the issue of public transport and the availability of a, of a good public transport system. And Madam Speaker, while I was uh, in the Ministry of Works, you know, there was a very active discussion um, at the time when Mr. Roger Ganesh was the um, Director of Highways about a dedicated lane coming from south to north for maxi taxis and for buses. And I still am hopeful that that can be implemented between uh, specific hours, for example, between um, 6 o'clock, 5.30 in the morning, or 5 in the morning, and 9 in the morning, so that um, you, you can have that lane um, going up, you know. To avoid congestion in, in, some, in, in London, for example, you have to pay a tax to go into the inner city of London. Yeah. I'm not advocating you have to pay a tax to go into the inner city of um, Port of Spain. But that actually exists. Yeah, high occupancy vehicles, uh, we should have that lane, high occupancy uh, vehicle lane that we, we should use. Um, I don't know, I see the Minister of National Security nodding his head. I don't know if it's <laughs> that point. But, um, but it's something that I, I, I still think that, that is possible um, and that, that could it happen. We, if you get that lane going, and I, I believe if you utilize very properly um, during those hours, they are already um, paved um, area outside the three lanes on the highway, um, you may be able to get that, that high occupancy vehicle um, lane into, into Port of Spain and on the evenings going down, going down, down to south. Um, Madam Speaker, so the number of cars we have on the road, that's a problem. The number of, a number of, of drivers who are probably not capable of um, driving properly and the kind of things they do on the road, I think that is a problem. But I do really believe that um, vehicle failure is less a cause of the fatal accidents than um, would be the, the driver errors that, that, that uh, occur and so on. Madam Speaker, while we look at, at, at the speed of vehicles on, on the roads of, of our country, at the same time, we have to look at some very specific areas um, in our country that, that require um, some serious attention. And uh, I, I call them black spots. And these black spots must be examined. And there are some popular ones, if, if you want me to use that word popular in inverted commas. For example, Twin City Central and Churchill Roosevelt Highway intersection, which has been the scene of many fatal accidents. Many, many fatal accidents. At Macquarie, um, that's another, another one where Price Mart is, is located there, that intersection by Jai Ram Kisun in that area. Another area that we have to look at is the, the stretch by the Diwali Nagar. That has been the cause of several, several accidents, and there has to be a reason why that, that is happening. The Churchill Roosevelt Highway and the Wallerfield intersection is another area that, that we have to look at. And also, um, Piaco Connector Road and Golden Grove intersection. These are some of the, of what you call the, the black spots that, that have to be examined um, if we are to be very careful in our approach um, to saving, saving lives in, in, in the country, even as we deal with this matter of, um, of speed on the, on the road. I'm very happy to know that we have done the, 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 the reclassification 
of the roads. And I could understand very well how tedious an exercise um, that, that was in order to complete. But Madam Speaker, we have, we have to, to look at transport and traffic management in a more holistic fashion in, in, in the country. In the country. And we have to, to ensure, ensure that we change the whole... For Tabakit, the original 30 minutes are now spent. You're entitled to 15 more minutes if you wish. Thank you. Please Thank continue. you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, we, we have to look at some of the other things that are causing traffic problems. For example, we lack in this country proper transit hubs. Proper transit hubs. And I think that we should construct transit hubs in Chaguanas, Arima, and St. Augustine. We should have traffic hubs in those areas. I think it's very important. But I also think that in a place like Chaguanas, we should be able to have a system where we have public car parks on the periphery of the towns and smaller vehicles to move people in and out of the town. And we could very well introduce a greening of, a, of, of, of the Chaguanas community or the Arima community. Well, let's take Chaguanas because I'm more familiar with the, a greening of it. If you can have electric vehicles, the, what, you, what, you, what you have now is called put-puts. In, um, in a lot of countries, we just take about two, two persons or three persons on it. But have them as electric vehicles. So you come into Chaguanas, you park on the periphery of Chaguanas, and these vehicles take you into the town. You reduce the pollution, you, you, you begin to deal with small matters as it is of climate um, change, you begin to deal with more environmentally friendly approach to, to traffic management and, and your community, you affect the health of those communities, and you put a little bit of order into the community and reduce frustration. The, the, we have to think outside the box, and we have to think creatively in order to deal um, with, with, yeah, and make sure the car park secure. We provide some employment for people to also um, do that. Now, we have for a long time talked about um, the, 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 the bus, the bus rapid transit system. And I don't see any reason why we cannot develop a predictable bus rapid transport system from north to south and east to west. I think it can be done. We already have the the east to west um, priority bus route, and that, is, that can be, um, can be uh, predictable. But we can develop, if we, may, if we make the attempt, we can develop it also to, from south to north. All it takes is a little bit of engineering and imagination, and I think it can be done. Um, and we can reduce, we can reduce in that way a lot of frustration, and if people can get a, a reliable and sustainable a mode of transport, people are going to use it. People are going to use it. So the park and ride um, matter in Chaguanas, I think, is, is, is very important. And I may say, you know, that in, in Chaguanas, two-level facilities can be built, for example, at Woodford Lodge. It can be built near uh, the Mulchan Suchan Boulevard. It can be, be built in the area of Clear Street, Montrose, near the, at the corner of Caparo Valley Brass Road and Edinburgh Boulevard Connector Road Bridge. All that, in fact, can be done. Um, you know, as a political party, we have been looking at the transport system and we identified also in Coover, where you can have some of these park and ride facilities, the intersection of Camden Road and Coover Main Road, and Phoenix Park Road just east of the fire station. We have identified this because, you know, in our approach to um, coming back into, into to governance, which we will um, in the future, we are identifying what has to be done in the interest of the public. And this is why... I'm putting forth these ideas because we, we have the ideas um, to, to imp implement. So, Madam Speaker, I am in support of um, what has been presented before the House. I'm in support. But, you know, I make these points and I hope that they, they are treated with the um, respect that the, the points deserve because they, they are not ma being made for any kind of political gain, but they are being made in the interest of, the, of human welfare and the saving of lives, and for a more orderly, more progressive, and better, better society. Madam Speaker, all of this is really what is about a culture change, 
a shift in how we do things, a shift in how we behave in the society. Whenever we debate things in this parliament, it's really about the shift in are we prepared to behave differently. And if we are not prepared to behave differently, nothing is going to happen. Madam Speaker, on that note, you know, it is, it is like a child who is an errant child. And you keep telling the child, you're an errant child. And today, you, 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 you put two slaps on the child, tomorrow two belts, but two weeks after, the child returns to the same behavior. And you know why? Because you have not changed the belief system of the child. Behaviors do not change unless the belief system changes. Beliefs promote behaviors. What kind of beliefs do we have about this society and the kind of society we want to build that will then motivate and inspire us to a different set of behaviors? That is what was missing also in terms of the budget presentation. Yes, he spoke about paradigm. But the, what is the paradigm? The paradigm is a paradigm of beliefs that we can be a better society, that we can rise to higher level of uh, higher standards, and that we can in many ways do things differently that can make us really not the kind of way people see us as a third world society, making mistake after mistake after mistake, <clears throat> but as a first world society and of a people capable of being better, doing better, seeing better, and at the same time contributing to the well-being of the world. Thank you very much. And the National Security. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker, for allowing me the opportunity to contribute in this debate on a bill and act to amend the Motor Vehicle and Road, Trans and Road Traffic Act, Chapter 4050. Madam Speaker, I want to first of all extend my congratulations once again to the Attorney General for no doubt leading the legislative framework that allows us to treat with issues not only with respect to road traffic, but also with respect to crime and criminality in Trinidad and Tobago. I also want to extend my appreciation for the hardworking professionals in the Ministry of Work and Transport, who have no doubt worked assiduously in putting together the various kind of hard work to bring to fruition this bill before us today. Madam Speaker, this bill cannot be taken in isolation, but it must be based on the cumulative effect of legislation that was brought before the House. In particular, mentions with respect to the demerit points, the red light camera system, the reform of fixed penalty system. One has to take all these into consideration because the increase, or in particular the bill that the areas, the clauses that we amended today, is part and parcel of a wider framework of bills that would bring a change in the way we treated our roads and movement of our roads in Trinidad and Tobago. Madam Speaker, the bill itself is a very simple one. The amendments are very simple. And as such, I will take just as enough time to bring to, to the public and the people of Trinidad and Tobago's notice what, in fact, the Ministry of National Security intends to do when this bill comes into effect, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, the bill touches on, in particular, the second schedule, the second schedule, in particular, I go straight to the second schedule, section five, which speaks to renumbered by leading the word 65 and substituting the word 100, and in, and in six, in paragraph H, as renumbered by deleting the word 80 and substituting the word 100. I want to put out, Madam Speaker, there is also a situation whereby we, in our vehicles, we do have, even today on our roads, some speedometers recorded in miles per hour and some recorded in kilometers per hour. Most of the European vehicles still recorded in miles per hour. So I want to ensure that the population understands that 100 kilometers is really 60 miles per hour. And 80 kilometers is really 50 miles per hour. It's important for us to make that distinction because there may be a culture where we do not even look at our speedometer. I mean, sometimes we feel that traveling at 50 miles per hour or traveling at 80 kilometers per hour. And there may be a lack of understanding if we mistake both against the other. So I want to put it out quite clear that 100 kilometers is merely 60 miles per hour when calculated. And 80 kilometers is 50 miles per hour. It's important for us to make that distinction, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, as we look at the, the question of adjusting the speed limit, it's important for us to also understand that as a government, we believe that 
we have to change the culture of people in Trinidad and Tobago, the culture of motorists in, in Trinidad and Tobago. But we also have to understand that we are not the only country in the world that has adjusted their speed limit over time. For the other jurisdiction that has moved and realized the benefits in changing the speed limit and in increasing the speed limit. For instance, Madam Speaker, in the United Kingdom, the speed limit is 112 kilometers per hour on dual carriageways. The speed limit in Germany, as set by the federal government, all limits, there are two default speed limits, 50 kilometers, and inside build-up areas, 100 kilometers. And of course, we know about the autobahn where there's little or no speed limit. In Australia, Madam Speaker, the speed limit on many arterial roads are posted by the appropriate speed limit signs and can range from 60 kilometers per hour to 90 kilometers per hour. The default speed limit, however, in Australia on the freeway is 100 kilometers per hour. Madam Speaker, so that in most of the built up, most of the countries, you'd see that they have adjusted, and again, it's based on a number of factors. They've adjusted their speed limit. And some of this research has shown that in adjusting the speed limit, they have reduced the amount of incidents, the amount of accidents that have taken place, Madam Speaker. But Madam Speaker, from a national security perspective, what is most important as we adjust the speed limit on the roads of Trinidad and Tobago? And really and truly, the Attorney General had pointed out in his contribution that the laws at the time when the speed limit was set was based on the road conditions. I myself can, can, can thoroughly remember when I joined the Coast Guard in 1974, there were no highways. And it took me at least more than three or four hours to get from point 14 to Chagaramas in those days, where you have to pass all through Point of Pier and so on, and pass in the Southern Main Road, pass through, coming through Nike Donna and so on, and then hit the highway. And there were single roads, so quite, quite. So it took us some time, but the speed limit remained. We have since gone past that. And as I said, the Attorney General has, has mentioned that. We've gone past that. And we have now developed our roadways, which are some of the best in the Caribbean right now. And therefore, we have to now make adjustments to suit the kind of roadway that we have and to suit the kind of vehicles that we have. But more importantly, if we're looking at the area of production, we have seen the amount of man hours lost on our highways with vehicles being stuck in traffic because based on the adjusting to the speed limit. So we have to look at a combination between production and of course law enforcement. So Madam Speaker, I believe one of the most important part in terms of moving the speed limit forward to what we are moving towards is in fact law enforcement. How does law enforcement now adjust to suit what we are trying to achieve in the bill? Madam Speaker, law enforcement must be there to create a deterrent with respect to the recklessness on our roads must be there to ensure that people observe the speed limit. And as the speed limit moved to 100 kilometers in some instance, and to 80 kilometers, it means that people have to adjust to those speed limits. And the law still means if they go above those speed limits, it's similar to where we are. If you go above the speed limit, then you are breaking the law. There's no doubt about it. So whether it's set at 100 or 80, the law means that that's the maximum allowable speed that you are allowed to travel on the roads of Trinidad and Tobago. And therefore, in terms of law enforcement, one of the strategic imperatives I mentioned before is in terms of deterrence. Deterrence is very important with respect to the activities, with respect to the deployment of Trinidad and Tobago Police Service, who are the guardians for law enforcement in the road of Trinidad and Tobago. So therefore, you, we would see, and the police, I must say, have in fact quite willingly supported this move, Madam, Madam Speaker. The Trinidad and Tobago Police Service has in, indicated that they certainly support this as part of the road policing strategy. So therefore, law enforcement will have to increase their deterrence on the highways of Trinidad and Tobago. And not merely by manual presence, but in, in terms of using technology to a large extent. The increase of highway patrols, the increase of motorbike patrols, again, the rapid response unit. And you have seen from time to time, Madam Speaker, that we have, in fact, increased that presence on the road, I'm um, no doubt, Citizens of Trinidad and Tobago would say that they have seen an increase in presence of police vehicles on the road, in strategic points, at certain hours, almost a 24-7 presence on the road, and that's a deterrence. And you have seen people who have slowed down just by merely seeing a vehicle parked at the sideway. They are not too sure whether they are in the speed guns or whatever the case may be. Madam Speaker, there's an experiment that was done in Canada where the, the, the Royal Mounties merely parked a police vehicle on the side of the road 
with dummies in the vehicle and observe people literally slowing down because the police vehicle was parked on the highway. And the vehicle. That's a deterrence. And therefore, the presence of vehicles on the road, the police on the road, is important as we go forward, as we change the speed limit to 100 kilometers per hour. And the Toronto Bigger Police Service is inclined to do so. And I want to take the opportunity once again to congratulate and commend the Toronto Bigger Police Service for the hard work that they're doing, not only in terms of traffic management, but in dealing with crime and criminality in Trinidad and Tobago. Madam Speaker, we continue to, to combine not only our presence, but also in terms of initiating or continuing the work of the, the DUI squad, the Driving Under the Influence Squad, which I mentioned some time ago in the House. We are going to build the capacity of that squad again and expand them throughout the length of breadth of Trinidad and the Dago. Because again, there's a nexus between the use of alcohol and driving that has caused a number of carnage on our roads. And again, we're going to act as a deterrent with respect to persons who are so inclined in driving under the influence of alcohol. So we're going to increase the squad as an act as a deterrent in terms of in administering the breathalyzer test and so on at the appropriate time and place. The introduction of speed guns is another measure, Madam Speaker. And recently, the government through the Ministry of Works and Transport has increased the amount of speed guns available to the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service. We have seen the effect of the speed guns and the culture change in Trinidad and Tobago when it was first initiated. We have seen the effect that that had on the culture and the mindset of the, the, the drivers on the roads of Trinidad and Tobago. And therefore, we have, the government has decided to increase the amount of speed guns that are available for the roads of Trinidad and Tobago. And the, the strategy is very simple, Madam Speaker. The strategy is one in which the motorists will not be aware when the speed guns are being utilized. So they, they, they will create the impression, as far as the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service strategy is concerned, that they'll always be outside there 24-7 so that the motorists will not know when they're there or not. And therefore, the culture is that they will be there and therefore will condition them to, to drive in a particular manner, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, we're also going to utilize in our, our CCTV system together with the red light cameras. When you combine all those initiatives, Madam Speaker, it is really about getting a, a cultural change, a change in the way we do business in Trinidad and Tobago. Madam Speaker, the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service, as I mentioned, completely support this initiative because they believe that there is a, almost a win-win situation, a win-win with respect to law enforcement, a win-win with respect to the motorists, and also a win-win with respect to increasing the production level of Trinidad and Tobago. They have done so by, uh, by looking at the history of the, of the road carnage over time, Madam Speaker. And the history shows, Madam Speaker, that in 2008, there were 262 road deaths across Trinidad and Tobago. And this, Madam Speaker, has been the highest number in our record history. Therefore, according to the Trinidad Tobago Police Service, safety of the roadways for the citizens of Trinidad Tobago is proven to be very important in how they go forward. But in recent time, Madam Speaker, Trinidad Tobago Police Service has seen a, consi a consistent drop in the level of deaths on our roadways as a result of road traffic accidents. For instance, there were 161 road deaths in 2014, 142 in 2015, 135 in 2016, Madam Speaker. The 2016 total is the lowest annual total of road deaths since 2001, Madam Speaker. So we have seen a reduction, Madam Speaker. And so this new level, this new level can be attributed to a combined effect of one, what the Toronto Tobago Police Service has been doing in terms of their, 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 road, their policing, road policing strategy, in terms of educating the driving public. And you have seen numerous ads on televisions. They have done it in their community drives, in their community uh, meetings, and so on to talk to the public, to get them aware in terms of driving and driving conditions, and care of the vehicles, and observing the rules of the road. They're viewing the extensive use of the breath, breathalyzer test and so on for drivers, both in a voluntary permission and so on. They have done it, for instance, you have seen them, in, especially around carnival times, doing voluntary testing. So people are allowed to know their, their limits before they even go onto the road. They have done that in a number of occasions. The Toronto Bay Police Service has been there in terms of a preventative measure and also a law enforcement way to treat with that issues, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, one of the, I think, most impactful measures that the Toronto Bay Police Service has used within recent time, and I want to emphasize that, is in fact that introduction of the speed guns. I want to go back to it because, you see, Madam Speaker, the speed guns cause Certainly a, a cultural change that was admittedly so by a number of people in Trinidad and Tobago. 
And while it was effected in May 5th, 2016, there was, in fact, a national impact. Hence the reason why we're going to repeat and going to increase that measure, especially as we move forward to introduce or increase the speed limit. It certainly caused drivers to take a look at their speedometers. As I said, it's not cultural. We don't do that. We don't even look at the needle. We just, but it caused them to take a second look. And we have seen that in 2016, as a result of this, there were 11,294 speeding tickets were issued to errand drivers. That's in 2016. For 2017, Madam Speaker, so far they've issued 16,580 speeding tickets have been issued. It is noted that enforcement of speed control has caused major responses by drivers. Some giving clear support and some expressing, you know, of course, different kind of responses. But in the main, people appreciate the work that the police are doing because of the presence of the police deter not only them, but of course you look after other drivers themselves because then when you're a driver, Madam Speaker, you may be very cautious, you may be taking your time, observing all the rules and regulations, but the errand drivers on the other side are the ones you also have to look out for. And hence the reason why the police presence is so important. Madam Speaker, what has been noteworthy is that there's an obvious correlation between the introduction of speed control and the, re and the reductions of death in our country. That is according to the police statistics. So as the year 2016 showed the lowest figure of road deaths since 2001, and at present the year 2017 is showing further reductions compared to 2016. To date for 2017, the figures are 101 road deaths for 2017, Madam Speaker, the lowest so far in recorded history. And again, it has the effect based on the introduction of the, a number of different measures that have been done by this government of Trinidad and Tobago. A number of measures come together to deal with that cultural change that we're talking about. So that there's almost a 9% decrease between 2016 and 2017 in order that's because of a cultural change that we are going to reinforce. We are going to reinforce through the national security initiatives, especially by executed by the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, at the end of the day, as we introduce these new laws, as we introduce the increase in the speed limit and so on, the laws by themselves will not bring about in totality because not every single person in Trinidad Bego will observe the laws of Trinidad Bego. What is intended at the end of the day, Madam Speaker, is for us to impact and influence the citizens of Trinidad Bego to take responsibility for the actions. There's only one driver in a vehicle, Madam Speaker. One driver allows to drive any vehicle in Trinidad and Tobago. And therefore, we have to take it down at the individual level, the level of the individual. We have to send a certain kind of message at the level of the individual to take responsibility. In life, Madam, Madam Speaker, there are really two circles that affect us as individuals. One, a circle of concern and a circle of influence. And so what we have to do is ensure that our drivers understand that they have control over that vehicle, that they are the ones that are responsible for going past the speed limit. They are the ones that are responsible for causing accidents. Those are the ones that are responsible for any carnage on the road. It's really the deeper than just the laws. Laws by themselves can't make it happen. We have to put culture together with laws. And I think the Attorney General mentioned it a while ago. We have to embrace that. So in other words, we all as citizens of Trinidad Tobago must come on board. And we all have to be courteous on the road. We have to be disciplined on the road. We have to observe the laws of the road. If we don't do that, Madam Speaker, then it is not the speed limit to blame. It's not the increase of the speed limit to blame. It is our own attitude and behavior as a people to be blamed, Madam Speaker. So therefore, as we pass these laws, this bill, and as we look at increasing this, we also have to tap it on the second front. We have to look at changing the mindset, uh, allowing people to be empowered, allowing them to understand that they have that power over the circle of influence. They treat the issues among within their own sphere. And as I said, a vehicle is controlled by a single individual, he or she is responsible for that vehicle. He or she is responsible for observing the, the laws and regulations. And the Ministry of National Security work together with the Ministry of Works and Transport. Because while they continue to fix the physical structure of the road and so on, in terms of making sure the road are passable and so on, and deal with issues, the Ministry of National Security continues to work, and as we say, as a whole of government approach, between the Ministry of Works and Transport, the Ministry of National Security, the Attorney General's office. We will continue to do so. But we also bring in our other ministries, who are also the culture shapers, within the whole the wider society. So that every opportunity as we get as a government, we're gonna to talk to 
and talk to the citizens in particular, that as we increase these roads, these, these speed limits, ensure that you will take responsibility for actions. Madam Speaker, the Trinidad Police Service will continue to raise the level of presence, continue to raise the level of consciousness, continue to do what is required to treat with the roadways and the highways of Trinidad and Tobago to ensure, Madam Speaker, that there is discipline, to ensure that there is pro production, and more importantly, Madam Speaker, there is tolerance on our roads of Trinidad and Tobago. Madam Speaker, I thank you very much. Member Fisher, go on cease. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker, for allowing me to contribute to the Motor Vehicle and Road Traffic Amendment Bill Number 2, 2017. Uh, much has been said so far about the rationale, and when one, if one were to really precede it in a sense, it is given credence to increasing the speed limit in our roads, uh, many of which have moved from minor roads to major roads and thoroughfares and highways. It also seeks to bring into line those vehicles with uh, up to 3,200 kilograms uh, which were formerly in the 25, 40 kilograms range and include the, for example, the Ford Ranger, the Nissan Navara, and many of those you would have heard spoken about before. Madam Speaker, I want to indicate that while we may have a few persons speaking on this amendment, this act is by no means trivial. It is extremely important. It is the difference between life and death. It is ensuring that you arrive alive at all your homes. And just to underscore the critical importance of what we are dealing with, with statistics received from Arrive Alive, for the year 2016, road user deaths, we would have seen that pedestrians comprise or constitute 33%, passengers 31%. Drivers, 31%. And Madam Speaker, what is also interesting is that the age of these victims. My colleague spoke about the budget speech indicating that there should, it's changing paradigms and really the sustainable future of our country. But how will we be able to sustain our country if we are losing our young, talented, educated minds? And even not so young ones, but our citizens will be able to make a contribution. In that regard, Madam Speaker, maybe it might be interesting for us to note that the age of the victims as a percentage of a total, and for those between 25 years and 34 years old, it comprised the first category of 23% as the age of the victims of road users. The second category is in the age group of 45 years to 54 years, and that comprised 17%. And the third category, between 15 and 24 years old, 16%. Madam Speaker, as my colleague and I agree to support the amendment, there are some facts I would like to present, but also to offer some suggestions to my very good friend, the <coughs> Honorable Attorney General, Member for San Fernando West, and also the Minister of Works and Transport, who is sitting and listening. We have heard that there are arguments for and against increasing the speed limit. And in some cases, we would have heard the argument that the reason of the speed limit actually lowers collisions on the road because you will not have people going at variable speeds. And in some cases, if you drive on certain roads abroad at a lower speed, you are ticketed. And maybe what is indicated as well, much has been said about Germany and the Autobahn and Canada and other places. And you, when you compare Germany having a debt rate of 6.9 per 100,000 cars, while Canada has 13 per 100,000 cars, it says that it is not fair to only blame factors in terms of speed. What they're indicating as well, that other considerations may be the lack of driving skill. They also talk about car safety and the quality of road conditions. In addition to that, environmental conditions, and as, as, in, as obtains in many other countries, and to some extent, or to a lesser extent here, bad weather conditions. It goes on to say that arguments, again, for the increase in the speed limit 
maybe that they were the prob the real problem might be that there are too many real too many drivers that may be the real problem. And some of them may not be very competent in terms of driving. So that it says that speed doesn't necessarily kill. That it might be safer in some cases. It alludes to the fact that there may be too many drivers. And it also talks about the fact that when you, if you increase the speed limit, and this has been shown scientifically and proven, that there's less road rage and reckless driving. Of course, one may argue to the contrary as well. It is also confirmed that by studies, you will have a faster time to commute, but there's also a risk in that if you cannot control uh, the, the vehicle, very importantly for us to consider. And we will also ensure that there's a fast, the faster speed allows for efficient traffic flow. And believe it or not, another factor is that drivers are more at ease. When you look, Madam Speaker, at some of the disadvantages, you would have heard about the fact that at a faster speed, it will be more expensive for drivers in terms of fuel, in terms of consumption, in terms of pollution. And it is also recorded that there might be an increase in road traffic accidents. But what, in addition to the factors that have been mentioned, I think it is true to say that there will be an increase in the amount of wear and tear of your vehicles, in the depreciation of the vehicle for its resale value if it is not properly maintained. Madam Speaker, much has been said about Canada, and in terms of Jamaica, the current speed limit there is 110 kilometers on highways. But I think I want to get into some other situations and to other facts. The Honorable Member for Point Fourteen mentioned the police presence. I think it is important for us to say yes, that is very important for the police presence, but I think I will want to share with you some of the data that talks about police strength out of a manpower audit. And this audit uh, is the final report of the Police Manpower Audit Committee, Volume 1, um, which was presented to the Honorable Prime Minister on October the 17, 2017. It says, Madam Speaker, that the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service states that as at February the 13th, 2017, the sanction strength of the TTPS is 7,884 officers. That the actual strength at that date was 6,768. That is 86% of what was officially required for the TTPS. In other words, it is saying that there is a shortage of manpower. It showed, therefore, according to the data, 14% or 1,116 officer positions as being vacant. And the question we have to ask ourselves is if you are saying that there is going to be increased police presence, how does that match up? How does that stack up with the fact that you have over 1,000 or 1,100 vacancies that need to be filled? And one might be saying, one could argue the case as well, that it is not very effectively or efficiently being utilized. Madam Speaker, further, 10 to 20 percent of officers are not on duty at any one time due to several leaves, such as vacation, injury, sick, extended sick, study, casual. no pay, casual, or suspension. So if we take away the officers who are on leave from the actual strength, we have an estimated 4,700 officers available on any given day. Madam Speaker, if we were to split a day into two shifts, for example, there are estimated 2,350 officers in active duty on any one shift. Madam Speaker, I think all of these things are critical for us. And it is also noteworthy that the acting police commissioner indicated on November 16, 2017, and I want to quote here, he said, the police we were now focusing on the roads and detection of drivers driving under the influence has been increasing. There have been 16,518 such detections for the year so far. I note this morning that the Minister of Works and Transport, and I saw him on a television program, and I subsequently received a correspondence from the Ministry of Works and Transport indicating 
that he has signed an order for nine additional UDAR speed guns, and thereby increasing the complement of speed guns from six to 15. Madam Speaker, the question we have to ask ourselves is of the six that we have, how many of those are working? Sometimes you see the speed guns in operation, and then you do not see them for quite a while. And therefore the question is, if they're not working, are they being repaired? Or are these nine that you're going to be adding to the sixth? How many in total will you have that are effectively going to be in operation? Many of them may not be actively uh, working, and therefore you don't have the kind of uh, vigilance on the road that you expect. The member for, uh, for point 14 also indicated the number of speed gun tickets that were issued. Madam Speaker, it appears to me, from when I'm reading this, that this is a business that is doing quite well, and maybe better than some of our businesses in, the, in various sectors. And I just want to repeat, uh, and I will give the calculation which the member for point 14 did not give. So my figures indicate speed gun tickets issued in 2016 were $11,294 amount. And in 2017, 16285 as of most recently. And when you calculate that, it, it totals to, in two years, of the issuance of speed tickets, a total of $27.4 million in two years. Madam Speaker, I indicate that this is not only a deterrent, but therefore it is very important for us to ensure that, and the point I was making, is that you're going to have an increased police presence. But based on the data that I've just supplied, how are we going to ensure that it's done? Are more people going to be taken on into the police service? Do you have more vehicles? What is the role of VIMCUT and the maintenance of these police vehicles or private contractors? The member for Point 14 indicated that we see quite a lot of police vehicles. But where do we see most of them? On the highways, where they want to be seen? Or do we see them in the other thoroughfares? Or do we see them now and then? And I have seen people in front of me, from the time they see what looks like a speed trap, they mash brakes, and therefore it could really cause a lot of problems to those at the back. Madam Speaker, I think one of the other things that we have to, to look at, and I'm sure it may have been mentioned, but I just want to elaborate on it, in terms of defective vehicles. I cannot tell you when last I would have seen a police vehicle stop any other vehicles, or even the licensing officers, and examining the tires on vehicles. Very often you would have seen that a lot of vehicles may be using uh, inferior quality or smooth tires. And one may not believe this, but actually smooth tires could deflate a tire quicker than if you have tires that are well treaded. Uh, it indicates that it is unsafe and it is really, these smooth tires really present an accident that is waiting to happen. 26, the study indicates, and this is a study from an expert collision repair company, indicates that 26.2% of the crashes studied involve vehicles with insufficient tread. And therefore, it brings into focus the whole aspect of road worthiness. Much has been said as well, even in the previous debate on motor vehicles, about removing the amount of corruption, and my colleague, the member for Tabaki, spoke about that. And I think one of the things we have to do is to also look at the whole aspect of revisiting the licensing process, where it is observed or it is evidence that some people pay for their licensing. And sometimes you jokingly tell people, like you buy a license when you see the way in which they drive on the road. Again, the aspect of learner permits and provisional licensing, the recommendation has been that it should be mandatory, and I think the Honorable Attorney General did take note of this, that it should be mandatory for all persons who have been issued a provisional license to ensure that before you get your actual license issued to you, that you go through a defensive driving course. And Madam Speaker, let me just say that I think we are not optimizing the use of our education programs. As a matter of fact, why is it not possible for us to prepare our future drivers on the roads, or even to ensure that the driving public is safe or safer or better informed 
by even making available classes for defensive driving or classes for learner drivers at some of our, our secondary schools that are virtually closed after 2.30 or 3 o'clock on evenings. Some of them have continuation classes. So that if we can bring these programs closer to where the communities are, it will be very useful. In addition to that, I think the Minister of Works and Transport, as he's here, could maybe consider what happens not only abroad and works well. Why can't we have television programs on a consistent basis, properly packaged, so that persons at home, in the comfort of their home, could view and could learn? Learning is not restricted to where you are. And therefore, you can learn anywhere, anytime. Whether it is in terms of the distance mode of learning or the blended approach, whether it is face-to-face -face, or it is in terms of mobile applications. Madam Speaker, I want to just raise a few issues as I continue and I will get to some recommendations shortly. One of the things that we are very concerned about is the whole issue about insurance. I noted when the Honorable Attorney General uh, began his presentation, he said that the whole aspect of data was completed in terms of the police and the licensing office. I noted, he said, that we are proposing the whole mapping of roads was done. He also indicated that the, the uh, aspect of data in terms of the police and the licensing offices were completed. And I'm speaker, I don't think there's any police car or any licensing vehicle of the licensing division that can stop you on the road of Trinidad and Tobago. I know it is not available now, and we'll be very happy to hear when the Attorney General responds, what is the kind of time frame as, you, as obtains in foreign countries. As the police car pulls up behind you, you have to come off the road. They go into the computer and immediately can tell you everything about what is happening with you. I, I have seen this. We have witnessed this firsthand. And therefore, it is an opportunity to deter, as the member for Point 14, Minister of National Security, is speaking about deterrence to crime and criminality. Madam Speaker, this is what perpetuates and continues to increase the amount of stolen vehicles. I have found out that while you may have, and my colleague was trying to find out how many vehicles are on the road, and they estimated it was about 900,000. There was another estimate of about 800,000 vehicles. And do you know what was being told? That of that 800,000 vehicles, uh, Honorable Minister of Works and Transport and the Attorney General, that approximately 150,000 of those vehicles may be uninsured and using the roadways of Trinidad and Tobago. And usually, the people who are uninsured are people of straw in some cases. So if you had to sue them, you are really get sued for nothing. You're, there's no reward or any compensation that you can get. And therefore, I, I think it is important for us to have this connection with the insurance companies. I was speaking to one of the insurance companies yesterday, and they indicated that every time they issue an insurance policy and certificate, they have to send, it is, they are required to send that information, that data, to the licensing office. Then how come? Of course, it is, it, you, know, you don't have enough scrutiny and vigilance, and the data is not, maybe not up to date, or not being updated, and is therefore not retrieved. It is not an any efficient system that you can pull it out and you can, you can utilize it. And what they are saying is that even if you discontinue insurance, that return, that information is normally sent to the licensing division. How is it then impossible for us to not know how many vehicles are on the roads and how many vehicles are uninsured or insured in our roadways? And therefore, this brings to bear as well the whole aspect of victims and their families of uninsured accidents. It has been stated that over $1.6 billion is sitting in the country's treasury to, to be paid out to persons injured or to families whose relatives died in vehicle accidents at the hands of negligent, uninsured drivers. Madam Speaker, no monies have been paid while owners continue to pay insurance, insurance premium tax, IPT. 
which you have been doing since 2008. And therefore, one of the things that is being proposed, and we are awaiting the establishment of this unit, is that government is yet to set up the Motor Insurance Bureau so that the 1.6 billion already in the Accident Victims Compensation Fund, the AVCF, set up by a, a, a former prime minister, will be able to be uh, implemented. Madam well, Speaker, I did indicate as well that there are some other issues that I would like to make reference to. And therefore, if we are talking about the future of our country, and we are talking about the future drivers, and therefore the potential of these drivers, or the competence of these drivers, or how do we handle these future drivers? Recently in a newspaper article, we saw, and increasingly so it in, in, within our school system, that the president of Chuta, Mr. Dudai, in a yesterday's newspaper article, <coughs> lamenting the fact that bullying is disturbing and worrying, and the figures are increasing. It is estimated that some 5% of this country's school population, which comprises some 250,000 students, face serious mental challenges as well. And I, I want to also indicate, the question will be, well, what does this have to do with, with the act? And I will, bring, I will indicate that to you shortly. Because if you do not take care and if you do not address these issues, these young adults are going to be our future drivers which can, again, cause themselves and others to be at risk. Um, and therefore, it is important for us, Honorable Minister of, of Health, Member for St. Joseph, to understand that if we do not deal with these issues now, they'll come back to haunt us in the future. Madam Speaker, some of the things I wanted to, to raise as well is that some of these accidents and the increased speed, because no matter what speed limit you, you set, you may always have someone trying to go faster than the actual speed limit. What encourages that as well? One of the things we have seen, and the police have recorded this, is that there is a modification of vehicles in their speed. These souped up engine, altered lights, big tires, contributors to vehicle accidents. So that it is not only the driver that we're looking at, it's also the vehicles. Madam Speaker, one of the things that we, could, we should also look at, and I have seen this, and you could drive around the highways and the roadways, is the absence of proper road signage. There's no doubt that there's vast improvement in this area, as indeed it is important for us to look at the whole concept and the aspect of road engineering. And therefore, the question always arises, that if you're increasing the speed limit on the roadways, what can we do to mitigate the amount of accidents, or the potential for accidents and for fatalities. Madam Speaker, I don't know how many of you would have noticed or become victims of very bright electronic signboards, very close to the roadways. Mm. It has been shown that one of the prominent causes of road accidents in this country and elsewhere is the level of distraction you face as a driver. There are some that are very close to the roadway. And the, 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 glare, the glare that, they, the, that they, they, they send out to you could really cause not only distraction, but can cause you some serious, um, well, I will use distraction in that context, away from and your focus in terms of the roadway. And therefore, I will ask the Attorney General and the Honorable Minister of Works and Transport to seriously look at the regulation governing the erection of billboards, signage, LED signages, cl very close to the highway, that you should have some stipulation in terms of the distance away from the roadway. Because if you do not do that, you are going to perpetuate. Madam Speaker, let me also say, it is not only in terms of those who will put up their signages to impact on their sales, but some road users have also complained about some police vehicles in terms of their lights, the blue lights, and it is also very difficult if you are driving close or behind these vehicles. And therefore, it is very important for us to limit the amount of distraction. Honor Speaker, I understand as well the government is trying to assist uh, vastly in terms of the safety of road users. 
We talk about increasing the speed limit. But you know sometimes, for the very flimsiest of reasons, people will slow down the traffic and cause a pileup or a backup of traffic. Uh, one of the persons involved in, uh, in terms of defensive driving and traffic management indicated to me that one of the things we want to change in, the, in terms of the culture of driving in this country, and he quotes it as macro traffic. That's the terminology he uses. He says from the time you slow down, or if there's, if there's an accident, or if there's a body on the road, unfortunately, everyone slows down. Of course, the police is controlling the traffic. But what he's recommending that we should consider is to cordon off that area and ensure that there's a, as fast a flow of traffic so that people don't have, they wouldn't be distracted by what is on the side of the road. Madam Speaker, I know that might be difficult because people want to see whether it is anybody who is connected or related to them. But I think the point is it is not only with respect to anybody who may have a fatality, but for any other reason that will cause a distraction and the slowing of traffic. Madam Speaker, in terms of the safety, one laments the fact, and we know that it, it is a cost item and therefore we are in challenging times, but we have to determine the priorities. And I'm sure the Honorable Attorney General will want to respond to that, and certainly the Minister of Works and Transport. As you drive along our highways, you'll see quite a lot of the cables uh, which is supposed to prevent crossing of the medians. Many of them have fallen down. They have been hit and they have been left. Madam Speaker, I want to recommend and to propose very seriously that if anyone is guilty of destroying or damaging those cables, they should be held liable. And in fact, they should be pursued through insurance to ensure that they restore what has been damaged. And if it is the current law, then let us impact it. Because what is happening is that the problem with the laws is that we have these laws, you know. We have all these fines and so on. The problem has been to enforce the laws. And I indicated before, because why are you saying that it is the law? And I accept that. But if it is the law, it continues. If you pass by for weeks, and I'm sure the Honorable Attorney General will drive on the highways from north to south regularly, and you will continue to see on a daily basis that these things are not being repaired. Madam Speaker, I want to also recommend for consideration that these young drivers and these lunar drivers, after every 10 years, and all drivers actually, should be exposed to some form of retraining. As we spoke about the, uh, the safety on the roads, I just want to go back to that a bit. Because some of the white lines on the Minister of Works and Transport and Attorney General, they are not properly marked, apart from the road signs. And could you imagine, and I am asking anybody who would have uh, been on the road at night particularly, when it is raining, and when the white lines are not very visible, how difficult it is for you to stay in your lane. In addition to that, what worsens the situation is on some of these major roads, where we are now increasing the speed limit from 80 to 100. You do not have street lighting properly organized. The bulbs are blown, they're not being repaired. And therefore, how will you want to come to the parliament and ask us to support, which we are supporting, but we are also asking you to do your job, to be responsible in terms of protecting us as road users, in terms of signage, in terms of markings, in terms of cautions. Could you see, do you see sometimes you have uh, road signs or road markings where pedestrians should or are supposed to have the right to walk where the traffic should stop. In Trinidad and Tobago, what do you think happening is people have to be playing box. You're running, you have to run back because the fellow is stopping. In a foreign country, you don't stop at the stop sign or you don't allow the pedestrians to cross. You're in for a ticket and very excellent, the flashing lights. Even in terms of the school crossings, we have difficulties with those. I'm saying all this because it impacts upon road users and it is going to be affected by the amount of the, the speed limit that is actually going to be increased today. So we talk about the aspect of database. Another thing that I want to recommend for the government to seriously consider is to have sometimes, although it is not applicable to what we're going to be, what we're debating today, but there's a visible absence of way bridges along any of our highways. Why is it not possible to have some of our T vehicles as well? Just pulled off the road and inspected. 
You look at, if you were to take the example of from Mount Hope to say the end of the highway down to San Fernando, you have no proper place except the turning base in the middle. I want to ask the, again the Honorable Attorney General, the Minister of National Security, particularly. We are talking about improving the service of the highway patrol. As far as I can recall, the closest police station, and it is a, one of the bases for highway patrol, is at the Freeport Police Station. If you look at from Mount Hope to San Fernando, there is no police station in very close proximity or along the highway. And I want to make a suggestion that you may want to have, and it doesn't have to be very expensive and exorbitant. Why don't we consider if you want to increase the, in terms of the safety and security of road users, in terms of, the, as the Honorable Member for Point Fortin was saying, the police presence, not only in terms of parking a vehicle, but where you may have police posts, if it doesn't have to be a full-fledged police station. Shall speaking time has expired. You have an additional 15. Thank you. Proceed. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I think, therefore think it is important for us to consider the construction, the implementation, or the establishment of some police presence, physical structure along these highways. It will also assist, if you might want to use it, for CCTV in the entire highways. Uh, although you have some of it now, and it is controlled from maybe some remote area, but the presence, as you say, and I want to agree with you and support you, that the police presence is indeed a deterrent. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I think one of the other things that we wanted to, 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 um, to, to put forward in terms of the whole aspect of safety and security, as I said, in terms of the implementation, the uh, Honorable Attorney General will say it is the law in terms of the fines. But one of the most dangerous aspects uh, we have seen in terms of driving and road users is what is called lean discipline. People just simply cut in and out. And there are fines here, which I need not read all of. But I just want failing to keep vehicle to the left of the road, $1,000. Improper overtaking on the left side of the road. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I don't know if you have, if you have experienced it. In our laws, if you would have seen some people they just cannot wait with the flow of traffic in the lanes. I have seen people regularly overtaken on the shoulder of the road at high speeds. And we have fines for those. And you're asking about the police presence. I presented to you to see today the, the, the shortage of on the vacancies, over 1,100 vacancies in the police service. Done, you know, this was proven through the manpower audit. Why is it not possible as well to even to get a complement of people, particularly if you want to establish your various units through the, the TTPS to ensure that all of these are implemented. My colleague as well made reference to the fact that one of the things that we lament is that it takes so long for you, you want to pay the fine, but you might take some time off from work and it becomes a challenge with the bureaucracy to get in there and pay the money that you want to pay to contribute to this $27.4 million in two years. And I just want to give a, a, some other examples. Obstructing, overtaking traffic. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I don't know if you have seen sometimes, if persons are using the road and they like the fact that you overtake them, they overtake you and they're slow in front of you, deliberately and mischievously. These are some of the things we talk about a culture change. It, has to, it, it is not only going to be voluntary con, uh, culture change, it has to be enforced. I often said I had the pleasure of studying in Singapore. And you can say what you want about Lee Kuan Yew. You can talk about the difference in culture with Singapore and Trinidad and Tobago. But Singapore, 272 square miles, a little more than Tobago alone, with, with five times the population of Trinidad, 6.5 million people. And the D word is extremely important. It is discipline, or you pay the penalty. And, and we, we have to move to a stage where unless we don't enforce the laws, People are going to say, well, I could get away with it. Mr. Deputy Speaker, we talk about road rage. And we talk about you know, people misbehaving on the roads. Sometimes there's induced frustration. I noticed that the Honorable Prime Minister had asked for a report by 4 o'clock the next day in terms of what had happened at the Payaco International Airport. But here you have hundreds of people who are coming off of an aircraft. 
many of whom may have jet lag. And they are going to be using the road after waiting for four hours in an immigration line. Is that not a potential for induced frustration? Is it, not going to, is, is it not a fact that they have a low tolerance level that could infuse, you know, becoming and unbecoming behavior on the roads? And therefore, I think as we talk about all of these, Mr. Deputy Speaker, it is important for us to ensure that not only are we increasing the speed limit to get efficiency in terms of the roadways, in terms of reaching quickly, in terms of uh, stopping the bottleneck of, and so on, but we have to ensure that some of these roads are properly fixed. You would have heard sometimes from my colleague as well, he spoke about potholes. And this continues to be an issue. For one simple hole in a road that is not repaired, and I know that the Honorable Minister of Works and Transport has a road patching unit, and maybe they need to be outside there, and particularly on some of the major highways and the roads. What will happen if you were to land into a pothole that has not been repaired at 100 kilometers per hour? where you have moved from 80 and you cannot control that vehicle, it is going to be disastrous. And therefore, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I think one of the other things as well that we have to, to look at is this whole survey of our bridges. Hmm. In the United States of America, that is an ongoing survey and it is a cause for concern. And sometimes we construct these highways and these byways and these flyovers and we simply leave them for use and you do not have any follow-up action. Some of these can contribute substantially to very deleterious and dangerous effects. And therefore, as I conclude, I just want to also indicate that when we look at what is happening on the roadways, while yes, uh, we support this measure, and there is room as well for improvement, I want to again underscore the point I'm making, that unless we have the police presence, and which could only be obtained in terms of the efficient distribution of the human resource in the TTPS, and also in terms of the required complement of persons, and the enforcement of the laws, and, the, and to remove the bureaucracy in terms of these penalties, we are going to be forever stuck in this time war. And we'll be coming back again to talk about maybe not only increasing the, um, the, the speed limit, because some countries, in fact, who have not been able to manage this increase properly, have gone back, they have reduced it to what it was before. I think we should always be looking progressively at the state of the country, and therefore with these few words, I, I thank you very much for the opportunity to, con to come in. I, rec I recognize the member for Mayaro. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Thank you for the opportunity to join in this debate this evening as we <clears throat> look at the Motor Vehicle and Road Traffic Amendment Number 2 Bill 2017. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I must inform the House that I am in support of this bill, like many of my colleagues. But I would also like to tell you up to 4.30 yesterday evening, I did not agree with it. And why I may not have agreed with it as a driver with over 30 years experience and having some 16 to 18 hour a day working and being on the road coming from my arrow to Port of Spain uh, at several occasions, I enjoy taking a little nap on route and I enjoy the fact that my driver, who is an exceptional driver by the way, he is also limited and constrained in maintaining the speed limit at 80 kilometers per hour on the highway. And also the drivers who are around us are also within that limit. So a conversation that has been happening among many of the young people in my constituency and among a lot of my peers was why are we going to raise the speed limit? Because there, is, there was a feeling that we're going to create more carnage, more road fatalities, more accidents if we allow people to drive faster. So one of the exercises that I did yesterday evening, Mr. Speaker, was to do a bit of research on my own to see what are the effects of raising or lowering speed limits. And I was really hoping to hear somebody on the other side, um, perhaps the Minister of Works and Transport, to tell this House how we arrived at the agreed limit of 100 kilometers. And I am sure the technocrats would have done quite a bit of work 
in terms of coming up to that limit because the question was, why not 120 kilometers? Or why not 140 kilometers? What makes 100 kilometers the sweet spot that we should really put our road users in terms of our highways? So in trying to determine, in, in determining, I'm trying to not to stay too long for us to keep us here, on, 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 on usually long. But Mr. Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker, in reading a number of the surveys that was done, I was attracted to one called the effects of raising and lowering the speed limits. Um, it was a report done by the U.S. Department of Transportation, and it was done between 1986 and 1992, and it was further redefined in 1996. And one of the objectives of that study was to, to do a research to determine the raising and lowering of posted speed limits on driver behavior and accidents on access to rural and urban highways. Speed and accident data was collected in 22 states at 100 sites before and after speed limits were altered. This, this, this testing was done repeatedly on 14 different sites simultaneously in order to get the accuracy of the data. So some very important information would have come out of it. And there were some key issues that the research led to, which I have in read, allowed me to change my perspective as a driver with 30 years driving experience to understand that it, it will not be a bad thing to raise the upper limits to the 100 kilometers as being suggested by the, the bill today. And I had to understand, and I was hoping that that would have been the position the technocrats at the traffic engineering department would have used, because to me it sounded like the most reasonable approach to determine the best speed. And in this research done by the, the US um, Department of Transport, they said that the majority of motorists select a speed to reach their destination in the shortest possible time and to avoid endangering themselves, others, and their property. So in selecting their speeds, motorists would consider the roadway, the condition, traffic, weather, and, and, and many other situational issues while they are driving. And based on that, a reasonable thinking driver will come up to a particular speed. What the test also did, it looked at, in certain areas, dropping the speed limit by 5, 10, 15, and 20 kilos. And then in some sites, they raised it by 10, 15, 20 kilos to see what was the effect on the overall speeds that driver, drivers were drive at. And <coughs> one of the primary reasons, the research said, for setting speed limits lower than the speed that they would have considered safe and reasonable was that there is a frequently held position that if you drive slower, there will be less accidents. And the research set out to prove if that was so. And conversely, the research also said, well, look, if we were to ramp up the speeds, let's see if it's going to cause more accidents at the end of the day. Mr. Deputy Speaker, what the research eventually found was quite the opposite, in that when you looked at the summary of the findings based on the research done, one of the, the things that they came up with was that lowering speed limits by 8, 16, 24, 26 kilometers per hour at the study sites had only minor effect on vehicle speeds. Posting lower speed limits did not decrease the motorist speeds. They maintain what they are accustomed driving at. Then conversely, raising the speed limit by 8, 16, or 25 kilometers at the sites also had minor effects on the vehicle speeds. In other words, an increase in the posted speed limit did not create a corresponding increase in the vehicle speeds. The findings also went on to say, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that raising speed limits in the region of the 85th percentile speed had an extremely beneficial effect on drivers complying with the posted speed limits. Now, what, what this 85th percentile really is? 
in testing the, the speeds of drivers over a fixed period of time, they looked and see what is the average speed that 85% of the drivers that we are testing today, what is the speed they were driving at? And they went ahead with the position that what, what the majority of drivers were driving at, that perhaps may be, may be the best suited speed because we are thinking that these drivers are reasonable thinking. They're, they're using their experience. They are looking at, at, at the road conditions, the, the, the length of the, the, the roadway, the, the performance of drivers around them. And that 85 percentile is where the sweet spot in terms of the speed limit ought to be. What they also found, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that accidents in the 58 experimental sites where speed limits were lowered increased by over 6 percent. They also found that accidents at the 41 experimental sites where speed limits were ramped up accidents decreased by over 8 percent. The level of confidence in these estimates were over 60 percent, Mr. Deputy Speaker. So the conclusion of this particular report that I, 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 I read quite at length last night, it convinced me, providing that is the, 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 the research and the assessment done by our engineering team at the Ministry of Works, that the majority of motorists on these highways, they're the increase in the speeds, the increase in the speed of 20 kilometers to 100 kilometers per hour will not create an overwhelming amount of recklessness at that speed because the research said that there would be very little variation. What we would see happening is that, as, as the member for Shaguanas, East um, spoke about $24 million in fine, you would see a, a, a vast reduction in the, amount of, in the amount of traffic fines in that drivers would, would tend to get in between that variation of the 80 to 100 and be well within the limits of the law. So after reading this document, um, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I was satisfied that the increase in the speed limit for both um, classes of private vehicles and those vehicles that are below the 3,200 kilos, which are the, 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 the T vehicles, those SUVs and 4x4s, I am pretty much convinced that I, as a driver who very happily to be driven at 80 kilometers, will be safe on the nation highways. So that being said, Mr. Speaker, I want to change the, the conversation a little bit in terms of uh, we have before us a bill with a parent bill with dozens of pages of fines and so on. And I'm of the view that this bill, we are treating this bill in this country like what we treat most other things. You know, we, we like to treat the symptoms rather than treat the root causes of problems. And the Minister of Health may agree with me that, you know, we have a, a line of medication for runny nose, itchy eyes, you know, sneezing. You know, we treat every single symptom for the common cold, and there are very few medications that deal with the issues of to toxicity at your kidney level that really creates a stronger immune system so you won't have to buy all these medications. The point that I want to get at, Mr. Speaker, is the Vehicle Amendment Bill really talks about fines, and they talk about fines for speeding, reckless driving, road rage, illegal parking. Um, it, 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 it tries to treat the issue of, of the road carnage, you know, with the hope that having a control, a, 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 a policing of the roadway really is the cure. And I'm of the view, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that we need to start treating the root cause. Why are people busy? Why are we speeding? Why are we angry on the nation highways? And Mr. Speaker, if we can address those concerns, in the economic times that we're in, I assure you the money that we would save in putting more red light cameras, more police, more vehicles, that money over the next 10 to 15 years could really go 
into our infrastructure and building more homes for our citizens, improving our medical care and so on. So I would like to crave your indulgence for a couple minutes while I speak to some of, of, of how do we address the root causes of that anger and that aggression that our drivers display on the roads. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker, as the member for Tabakid mentioned a while ago, his information is that we have 900,000 motor vehicles on the road. And that is quite a bit of vehicle for roadway. And traffic congestion is a result of a supply and demand issue. We have a fixed supply of roadway in this country and, and we are constrained by geography, we are constrained by cost. But we have unlimited demand for this very same roadway. How are we going to move 900,000 vehicles in any given period over a period of time, over a period of time in, in this country? How do we do it? What happens, Mr. Deputy Speaker, is that we end up in gridlock, we end up in traffic congestion on the highways. If you live close to the town centers, it takes you about an hour to move from St. Madeline into San Fernando. It takes you almost two hours to get from Trin City into Port of Spain. And Mr. Deputy Speaker, we have drivers, most of these vehicles, you have one person in the car and they are in the middle of the congestion and they are angry because I have to leave home at an ungodly hour to get to work. And being selfish people as drivers, we all are, we are vexed with everybody else in the traffic. You know, we are vexed because, you know, traffic coming from the left, from the right, in front. And we are angry. But we are also part of the problem. Because I could have found out from my neighbors, which, ones are, which one of you going to Port of Spain every day, perhaps we could carpool and create a situation where we could reduce the amount of traffic on the roadway. So being selfish drivers, it's all about us. So sometimes the traffic management unit makes changes in your town centers. And we have a problem right now in Rio Claro. We've made some changes to alleviate a, a traffic issue by the Rio Claro Hindu School. But I have people come into my office vex, blue vex, because I am being inconvenienced. But that's a selfish approach because we are trying to find a way to create a smoother flow of traffic for the entire community. And that is what really creates the anger among our citizens and you know we, we, we constantly we, we tell our public servants that you know you all are too aggressive you know you are swell up your face when I reach in front of the counter but these are the very same people who are stuck in traffic for three hours four hours back and forth from work and they're angry and they're naturally angry so Mr. Deputy Speaker how do we fix that how do we create a, a new paradigm in which we try to deal with the root cause of the problem. And when you deal with the root cause of the problem, we, we eliminate the need from having to manage every single symptom. And sometimes there are other beneficial effects of dealing with the root causes. Mr. Deputy Speaker, one of the things that we've been champion, I've been championing for for many, many years in my own constituency, um, sitting as the head of our business chamber for many, many years, is that we ought to be, you know, working smarter. Um, decentralization is something that have been bandied about for years, and there has been no true opportunity to do that. And while it has happened in, in some small measure, I think successive governments have not really done more um, in terms of moving some of the centralized services from our town centers into our communities. And if we look at some numbers, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I understand we have about 87,000 public servants. And I'm, I'm, I'm just speaking on the issue of, of the public service because we have numbers for those areas. So I'll, I'll, I'll use my numbers using the public service. If you divide that amongst the 41 constituencies that, that, that we have in this country, you end up with about 6,000. And if 50% of that, that, that number has cars, you end up with about 3,000 cars leaving the constituencies to get into the town centers to work. 
how do we stop or how do we prevent, how do we reduce 3,000 cars from leaving Mayaro Rio Claro and heading into Port of Spain, heading into San Fernando, heading into Chaguanas on a daily basis? And obviously, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the answer lies in what are they doing in these town centers that they can't do in Rio Claro or they cannot do in Mayaro? What is the work that they are doing that can't be done remotely via technology? in your local area. Mr. Deputy Speaker, if one-fifth or one-tenth, which is about 100,000 cars, are stuck in traffic for five and a half hours each day, and I'm saying this from my experience, leaving my arrow to come to Port of Spain, prior to the advent of the bus route pass, it would take me three and a half hours if I leave home at 4.30, I will get to Port of Spain around 8 o'clock. If I leave at 5, I will not get to Port of Spain until after 9. And then I can tell you of an experience leaving my office in Port of Spain on Maraval Road many years ago at 4.30, and I listened to 5 o'clock news, 6 o'clock news, 7 o'clock news, and there was no news at 8 o'clock. But I knew when the time passed because you sat in traffic. Now, Mr. Deputy Speaker, if you multiply 100,000 cars, let's assume it's one person, one worker inside that car, for five and a half hours a day, 240 days a year, we are losing, on average, 144 million man hours. That has a definite impact in how we do our business here. I'd like to give you an example of a situation with one of my OJTs just this week. My OJT had me sign a form to get her passport. And I gave her a day off, and she goes to San Fernando for the appointment, only to be told that because I made an error and I put one line and I initialed it, the passport office said, well, we're not going to take that. You have to go back and redo the form. So she comes back, I redo the form, she takes another day off. And we lost two days' work. She had to drive to, to San Fernando on two occasions. And I'm sure if you extrapolate that by 5,000 or 6,000 people with a similar situation, that is causing the traffic congestion. It's causing the need for all these set of fines and, and penalties that we are putting out there to really manage the symptom rather than the cause. Now, Mr. Deputy Speaker, at no time in the history of this country have we had more fiber infrastructure laid out in Trinidad and Tobago through Flow, TSTT, Digicel, all these other providers. And there is nothing technology-wise that is preventing the decentralization of government service into rural communities. Mr. Deputy Speaker, if I were to just give a simple example. Let's assume my OJT had this appointment for the passport office, but there was an office of the immigration department in Rio Claro. Let's assume in, in, in uh, member for Tabaki talk about the regional complexes where you have- Mr. Deputy Speaker, I, I really hate to do this, but 48-1, please. I... Overruled, proceed. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I will still oblige the Honorable Member from St. From Joseph that I want to tie it in. It's important that I tie it in, right? That we are looking at amending bills that are charging and, 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 and penalizing people for driving and so on. And all we're saying is that if we can treat the, the, the causes we may be able to make some headway as we go forward. Mr. Deputy Speaker, if we had decentralized that service into Rio Claro, this young lady may have taken just one hour. Right. And when she takes one hour and the error popped up, it means that she ran back to the office, we changed the, the form, she comes back. And we, she, she, she would have been able to have the officers who are sitting in Rio Claro upload the forms upload the photos, and all she would have had to do, Mr. Deputy Speaker, is go to San Fernando to pick up the passport on any given day. 
that saved time, it saved money, it reduced in the, the traffic congestion. But this is just an example, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And if you extrapolate that through all government ministries and you decentralize, we solve the particular problem of having, you know, all these vehicles pushing itself into our town centers. Mr. Deputy Speaker, as I come to the uh, close, uh, uh, <laughs> Ms. Member for St. Joseph, I just want to add that besides dealing with just the traffic, when you now have our public servants who can work closer to home, it's also improving their family time because they can leave home at more gentle hours, you know, make sure that the kids have breakfast, you know, take, drop them safely to school, pick them back up in the evening, have their dinner, see their homework. You have a much more happier employee coming to work on time. And, you know, the general service, the quality of service improves at the end of the day. So, Mr. Deputy Speaker, these are the kind of paradigm shifts that, that you know, this government brought into their budget conversation this year. And these are the kind of things that we ought to be looking at. I give my full support to the Attorney General for the bill. I have convinced myself, based on the research that I've done, that it will not impact in any, in any dangerous way for drivers with the increase by 20 kilometers on the highway. And um, I am happy to support the bill at this time. So thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Nice member for Princess Town. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I don't intend to take very long except to say to make some points that I believe is important to today's debate. Mr. Deputy Speaker, in preparation for today's debate on this particular bill that deals with amending the Motor Vehicle and Road Traffic Act, two things came to mind, one of which was an old adage which says, to whom much is given, much is expected. But also, when I listened to the member for San Fernando West, I was also reminded of something which says, with great power comes much greater responsibility. And having said that, I took my mind back to when we were debating an act to amend the Motor Vehicles and Road Traffic Act to introduce a system of traffic violations for certain breaches of the act to provide for the implementation of a red light camera system, a demerit point system, and the reform of the fixed penalty system and related legal proceedings and other related matters. And when I took my mind back to when the AG piloted that particular bill, I recall that the AG was at pains to speak about, and for most of his contribution, he kept tying back the point of the culture change that was needed and much needed in Trinidad and Tobago in terms of our attitude, in terms of our disposition, in terms of bringing about holistic change, whether it is in the area of road traffic management, whether it is in the area of garbage collection, in every facet of life in Trinidad and Tobago. And I think that was an important point that has been made by consecutive members. Mr. Deputy Speaker, in light of that, I decided to take a look at how other countries that we share similar jurisprudence with would have affected some of these cultural norms and changes that they wanted to see in their population, and particularly in 2015, when you look at the Canadian legislation and you look at the South African legislation, they dealt with something called the psychology of changing cultures, attitudes, and dispositions. And I just wanted to, ch to share a little bit of that because that has been our major challenge when it comes to effecting any real, tangible, meaningful change in Trinidad and Tobago. And as we go forward with specific pieces of legislation that will impact on the motoring public in terms of their behavior on our roadways and carriageways, it is important in terms of how do we measure whether or not the message is resonating with some of them and how do we get to the point where we want to be because obviously we know the Honorable Member for San Fernando West and other members have made the point that yes, we want to see progress but we know that it will take a considerable amount of time to see those attitude changes, the norms and the dispositions with respect to adherence to the laws and the revised laws of Trinidad and Tobago as mentioned also by my colleague for point 14. Mr. Deputy Speaker, there was a 10-point plan with respect to 
Canada and South Africa in terms of how they decided to deal with the psychology of changing cultures, attitudes, and dispositions in terms of the adherence of their laws, especially traffic regulations. The first one was that they identified a set of desired values and behaviors. Again, this is what we are doing today. But they indicated that our leaders clearly described the values and behaviors that we are seeking and embody those. The second one was to align the culture with strategy and processes, and I believe the member for Tabakit, well, he gave us some of the instances of experiences that he's had on the roadways. This ties into this particular point of aligning culture with strategy and processes. Looking at our mission, our vision and values, and consider how they line up with our processes, including performance management, things like compensation in terms of, again, one of the issues that was dealt with when asked by the member for San Fernando West in terms of the cable barriers that in the existing law it allows for persons who have, who have gone into the realm of creating these accidents and destroying those barriers that by law it is already on our statute that part of their responsibility will be to ensure that it is the situation is rectified in terms of um, preparing to the original status that these cable barriers were first met prior to the accident. And Mr. Deputy Speaker, in my short contribution, I will want to deal with the issue of the cable barriers in a minute. Mr. Deputy Speaker, as well, we look at in that 10-point plan, plan that was dealt with with respect to Canada and South Africa, was to connect the culture and the accountability. It said that each of us in this room can think about companies that have struggled to deal with culture but it had to do with that personal choice of attitudinal change. Mr. Deputy Speaker, they spoke about ha having visible proponents for culture change to stick. It must be a priority of those that has that responsibility. And it comes to the point, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that when we speak about great responsibility, and in terms of responsibility when we give people power, today's bill before this House also requires a greater responsibility of the state to put mechanisms in place in terms of dealing with increasing the speed limit. Mr. Deputy Speaker, they also spoke about measuring. And it is something that I spoke about earlier in terms of how do we use benchmarks to identify that we are getting to where we want to be. Then they indicated that while we will want to see those changes being effected, we cannot rush those changes and we have to expect. And therefore, again, there must be a plan coming forward by government in terms of addressing the areas of concern that the population has in terms of a national campaign, in terms of enforcing. Because I'll tell you this, many young people, I don't know, I know for a fact that there has been much public debate with respect to increasing the speed limit in Trinidad and Tobago. A lot of young people have been messaging me, MP, do you know whether or not they have already done it? Some people don't pay attention to the parliament or the legislative agenda in terms of what government is doing or even what we are doing here in the parliament. But I know for sure that one of the areas of concern was this particular piece of legislation that people were interested in whether or not that they will have the opportunity to, to, to go beyond the existing limit because it provided some sort of frustration on our nation's roads. But Mr. Deputy Speaker, while today as the member for Tabaki, has said that it is a populist issue and that it will resonate and it will find um, a lot of favor with the general public, especially motoring public. There are also those on the other side who have had experiences in this country and elsewhere that will be very apprehensive. And that area that was dealt with in that specific report in Canada and South Africa said, you know what, don't rush this thing. Do a pu proper public awareness campaign and let us be able to measure how you are seeing actual progress with respect to the implementation and the adherence to these laws. Mr. Deputy Speaker, they also spoke about, and again, the Attorney General spoke um, together with the member for Tawiki, that we cannot be afraid to take the necessary decisions that probably former administrations have uh, failed to implement, but we at this point cannot be afraid to make the serious changes that we wish to see in the society. And therefore, I believe that if the member for San Fernando West takes a look at, at those two particular studies, he will find it particularly enlightening in terms of how those two countries were able to advance their pieces of legislation. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I want to turn to the area of statistics. And I know the member for Point Fortin um, spoke, as well as a member for Mayaro, 
about the decreases that we have seen with respect to road carnage um, over the last 10 years. I also want to join with the member for San Fernando West in paying tribute to the work that has been done with organizations like Arrive Alive. I'll tell you this, for a long while, there was an absence of real tangible statistics that dealt with road carnage in our country. We depended on sometimes the newspapers to provide us with those things in terms of tallying and so on. But there was always a disconnect in terms of what was classified in terms of the, 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 the proportions of road carnage in terms of death, serious accidents, etc. And for a long while, Arrive Alive really assisted in helping to fulfill that role and that mandate together with other areas in terms of reducing and also sensitizing the public in terms of their responsibility and their role when it comes to road usage. But Mr. Deputy Speaker, in 2017 on the Trinidad Guardian, published on January 11th by Alexander Bruzel, it spoke about road accidents being reduced by 11%. I also want to turn to an article of the Trinidad Guardian published on Friday, December 25th, 2015, that spoke about the statistics and it spoke about the reduction by 8%. And in both articles, Mr. Deputy Speaker, there were a lot of similarities in terms of what, what created some of these reductions and what attributed to some of these reductions. And again, several members have spoken about the issue of the speed guns, the issue of the breathalyzer tests, the cable barriers, and so on. And I'm happy to see that there's a continuous move towards a decrease in road carnage in our roads. But again, when the member for Point Fortin spoke about the law enforcement bodies in Trinidad and Tobago, I want to remind the honorable member and members opposite that it not only requires legislation through the parliament, but it also requires equipping our law enforcement with the necessary tools. And that is why we were able to see significant reduction in terms of road carnage. You know, I met the Minister of Works and Transport prior to today's sitting, and we were able to discuss for a few minutes to the bill that is before the House right now. And I said, Honorable Minister, you know, I have no indication and I have no intention of being adversarial when it comes to this particular piece of legislation because I believe that supporting this piece of legislation will see a serious culture change in Trinidad and Tobago in terms of the motoring public, but also at the same time that we must be able to assist those like Arrive Alive, like other organizations, like the law enforcement, in terms of providing them with a real tangible tool so that they will be able to get the job done. And when you look at 2014, when we were in the government and we were able to provide um, for these speed guns and we were able to, to, to change some of the, 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 um, the laws at that time, we were focusing on our entire culture change, and I'm happy to see the member for San Fernando West is embracing that as well, because that is the area in which we need to go along. Sometimes we may not always agree, and that is the system of our politics in the Westminster system, but the thing about it, I think today is really a historic day and a good day for Trinidad and Tobago, especially the young people who are looking on with keen interest with this particular piece of legislation, that it is a good day that we can come together as a responsible opposition and a government to ensure that the lives and safety of the people of Trinidad and Tobago is placed as our priority. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I want to quote from the Hansard of the 16th of the 10th month, 2017, where, during the Standing Finance Committee. And Mr. Deputy Speaker, I quote, Member for Princestown, thank you, Madam Chair. Honorable Minister, again on line item 12, materials and supplies, Minister, I have been noticing on the highways that the issue of the cable barriers, the repair of those cable barriers, continue to be a burning issue, in that when there are accidents, it takes a long while for the cable barriers to be repaired, and in many instances, when you drive from north to south, there are many instances where those barriers have not been repaired in months. Could you give us an indication of how, through this vote and in any other program, a program would be put in place to deal with the cable barriers. I know the reason for justifying the bringing on of the cable barriers was really to save lives, but if we have where it is, but if we have where it is not being repaired months on, 
then it is not really effecting what it was supposed to do. Mr. Deputy Speaker, in that Standing Finance Committee, the Honorable Minister of Works and Transport responded, and this was the response. Minister Sinanan, the item that you are speaking about is under contracted services, and it is something that we are looking at because it is a very expensive maintenance. I can tell you at the ministry right now, we are looking at doing a feasibility study whether we can continue to afford it because the maintenance is very, very, very expensive. These were the words for the Minister of Works and Transport. Mr. Deputy Speaker, this morning I saw the Minister of Works and Transport on CNC3 um, together with Sharon Inglefield from Arrive Alive. I went post the same question. He sort of danced around the issue. Mr. Deputy Speaker, when you look again at that report that was commissioned by the Government of Canada with specific reference to British Columbia, the province of British Columbia, and also South Africa. One of the areas of research that came out of that by an institution called the Bureau of Field Services, um, attitudinal changes and measurements of cable medium barriers, it stated that it is a cost-effective means towards saving lives. This is what the report produced, Mr. Deputy Speaker. However, my colleague, the, member, the Minister of Works and Transport, is telling us that what they're going to do is that they're going to look at a feasibility study. Mr. Deputy Speaker, this is the same Ministry of Works and Transport where we've had several feasibility studies that costed this country over half a billion dollars. And Mr. Deputy Speaker, it is my sincere hope that we will not see, with respect to the cable barriers, a similar situation arising where feasibility study will be done and there will be still no maintenance of these cable barriers and there will be no decision that will be taken. I know when, again, when the People's Partnership was in government, this was a priority of ours and it worked. When we measured how it, how it worked, I remember the member for Tabakit was reminding me a few days ago where a cement truck in the vicinity of the Turuba Stadium slammed into several vehicles and was able to not cross the medium because of those cable barriers. Mr. Deputy Speaker, we have seen from time and time again how families have been affected in this country. You know, from my own personal experience, I remember I had a very close friend at the University of the West Indies that died in one of those accidents because of the fact that a car had crossed the median and slammed into his vehicle. Snuffed out the life of a young and who knows, he may have been a politician today because he was studying government at the University of the West Indies. I recall when I became a member of parliament, the most burning issue in the media at that time was a young man who became paralyzed from the constituency of Princess Town. The hospital had given up on him, but his family did not give up on him. And they took him home. And they fed him through tubes and so, Mr. Deputy Speaker. When it was brought to my attention, because he was from a very impoverished home, when it was brought to my attention, I visited that home, and I remember when I visited that home, purely coincidental, the media was there, and they took a photograph of me with a mask and gloves, and there was much public comment on why I was wearing a mask and gloves. And it wasn't very complimentary to me because there was much speculation in terms of whether or not I felt that, you know, um, I was not in a, in a conducive environment in terms of sanitation and so on. But it had to do with the parents had asked me to put on these gloves and a mask so that he will not get an infection. Because they tried their entire best to ensure that they kept him alive. But as the uh, Honorable Attorney General will tell you, and I'm sure through his own research and from his department at the Attorney General's office, there have been many families in this country who are still awaiting justice, where there would have been hit and run incidents in this country. And I remember that young man, Chetram, he died recently without receiving justice, Mr. Deputy Speaker. We saw recently where two young children were orphaned. orphaned. They will grow up without having a mother and a father, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And this is how the flip side to increasing this today's speed limit will have continuous impact on people's lives. Mr. Deputy Speaker, while there's good, there's also bad, and we accept that. But I also come back to the point that I made earlier today, 
that while we put the power in the hands of the motoring public, the state must also accept that there's a greater responsibility towards them in putting the mechanisms in place to ensure that we provide that support from instances that will be derived from accidents that will occur from time to time. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I would also like to look at the issue of insurances. Mr. Deputy Speaker, when you look at insurances in Trinidad and Tobago, you will notice that 43% of all insurances in Trinidad and Tobago has to do with motor vehicle insurances. I recall in 2017, September 2017, Mr. Deputy Speaker, ATIC, the Association of Trinidad and Tobago Insurance Companies, they sent out a pre-budget press release, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And in that pre-budget press release, Mr. Deputy Speaker, they called for strengthening of the motor vehicle insurance laws in Trinidad and Tobago. And that is something probably in the Honorable Attorney General's wrapping up that he may wish to look at in terms of whether or not Trinidad and Tobago will look at strengthening its motor vehicle insurance laws. The member for Tawikit spoke about that there are many persons driving without licenses in this country, but also there are many persons driving vehicles that have expired insurances or have no insurances at all, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, as I indicated, that in that press release in, sent out by Attic in September of 2017, they also called for the introduction of night courts, traffic courts, etc., which is something that I think on both sides of the house we have called for from time to time when we were in opposition. But Mr. Deputy Speaker, when we debated the bill that dealt with moving traffic offenses into violations, I spoke about the tribunal that was set up and that continues to exist in the UK, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I noticed that Attic is one of those organizations that has taken note of it as well and they also have been advocating for some sort of system. Mr. Deputy Speaker, it cannot be that with an apprehensive society like Trinidad and Tobago, where we are seeing continuous tactics being implemented, that whether or not this increase in the speed limit, that people will also feel that this is some sort of Ponzi scheme, that it's some sort of trap as well to increase revenues from government. Again, I hope that is not the intention, honorable members, but more so to empower our motoring public by giving them a greater degree of responsibility on our nation's roads, but also at the same time affect, accepting to themselves a greater sense of responsibility onto the government. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I want to turn my attention a little bit to Canada again in particular, because there were several, several provinces in Canada, Honorable Attorney General, that if you look at in 2015, they increased. They increased their rates in terms of the speed limit from 80 to 110. And in the space, and it, thank you, and in the space of two years, they have had to reduce it back to 80. Um, because of the fact that there has been an 11% increase when it comes to accidents and so on that have been attributed to the increase in the speed limit. Again, when we look at these international ben benchmarks, I think that there is a situation that is developing in Jamaica, which is very close to us, but it hasn't reached the point where they are reviewing their current legislation and so on. But in terms of the Commonwealth, if we look at Canada, we look at South Africa, you would see in several instances where in fact that they did increase their speed limits and then they had to reduce it two years later because of the conditions that were occurring on the nation's roads. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the statistics in Canada also show that Three in every four drivers travel above the speed limit on Canada's busiest highways and carriageways. And the member for Tawikit alluded a little bit to that culture. And I'll tell you this, Mr. Deputy Speaker, at times I myself, if I am honest, and members are honest in this house, I know the member for San Fernando East has been caught with this before. But member, if we are on direct the chair, please. If we are honest with ourselves, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I said uh, I I know it has happened to me. Sometimes your foot accelerates a little bit beyond, and you have to remind yourself you're going beyond the speed limit. And that reminder comes especially when you see those flashing blue lights along the highway. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I'll tell you this as well. 
the culture among young Trinbagonians, especially during the carnival period. I am a carnival ba baby. I love carnival, I play mass. And I am a Trini, carnival is my thing, I know how to party. As one Trinidadian had already said. <laughs> but Mr. Deputy Speaker, when you take the wheel into your hands, you not only take your life into your hands, but the lives of others. I've said in this house before, I'm not ashamed of it, because on every occasion, seven times since I've become a member of parliament, I've had a breathalyzer. On seven occasions, several coming from these carnival events. But that is a culture among the young people of Trinidad and Tobago. And today, while we give them that greater power, I remind them of that greater responsibility as we go into the Christmas season and then into carnival, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And sometimes, and I think it is something that, that several members have spoken of, especially on the government side as well, it comes down to law enforcement and abiding and adhering to the laws. I remember on several occasions when I was stopped, people said to me, but what, boy, why they stop you, use IMP? I joined the queue, I kept my mouth shut I, until they asked me to open, of course, to blow into the, the, the breathalyzer, and I complied. And Mr. Deputy Speaker, no one in this country is absolved from the laws of Trinidad and Tobago, and I implore all law-abiding citizens to ensure that when you see these changes being made to our legislation as we have seen today and on previous occasion, it is for the betterment of our population. And I'm happy to remember for Carney East referred to Arrive Alive again. That culture with that breathalyzer really took effect, not because of government or opposition or any member of parliament or any senator or any public official. It came because of the hard work of people in Trinidad and Tobago that started organizations like Arrive Alive. And I'm very happy when I hear that the government has indicated that they are continuing from the part that we took in the People's Partnership into partnering with Alive, Arrive Alive. But I want to say this also, Mr. Deputy Speaker. It cannot be that you're only there for the good times. So accept when you see that road carnage is decreasing, that you say, well, yes, we will appear on television with Arrive Alive. They require the support. That also means financial support. And the work that they have been doing have been yielding results in Trinidad and Tobago, Mr. Deputy Speaker. So again, I implore my colleague from San Fernando West and the minister of Works and Transport to really look at providing additional support to arrive alive so that they are able to continue the good work that they are utilizing. I know the area, going back to the cable barriers, I know in some parts of Trinidad and Tobago, especially around Nestle, where the Grand Bazaar intersection is, we have been using what you call the New Jersey barriers, which are the concrete barriers, but they're sometimes coated with plastic, which is another way of being a little bit more cost effective. However, sometimes it does not have the same result as the cable barriers. In that, it can cause more harm than good in several instances, as we have seen in the past. But again, Honorable Minister, when you talk about cost effectiveness and looking at the feasibility study, several countries have determined that saving lives are much more important and they have determined that it is a cost effective measure. Again, if you look at, look at the New Jersey model in terms of those barriers that they utilize, that we utilize in parts of Trinidad, especially along the east-west corridor, you will be able to identify some means in terms of <coughs> further utilizing those in other parts of especially the north to south route. You know, I'm coming up from south today, I'm, I'm looking along the highway. And I can tell you from Taruba, the turn off to go to Princess Town, straight up to Grand Bazaar, most of the cable barriers are down. And therefore, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I really want to implore, I mean, it's good to see you on television, Honorable Minister, becoming part of the awareness campaign and so on, but lip service will not cut the mustard. We need to ensure that we put systems in place. And therefore, that is why, you know, I really want to compliment um, the member for Separia. It was her vision and her foresight in terms of saving lives that brought 21st century technology and innovation to Trinidad and Tobago when it came to the motoring public. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I know several members have dealt with the issue of the MVA, the licensing, and so on. And all of that, Honorable Attorney General, has to do, again, with the culture. I know it's becoming a little bit repetitive now, and many of you want to go home. I'm seeing the sleep on your faces. But really, these were some of the areas I really wanted to address. I could have gone into great depth in terms of providing some of the statistics and so on. But I believe just as we are responsible on this side and our heart 
is in the right place in terms of providing for the people of Trinidad and Tobago. As I've said, many of us, whether it's on this side of the house or on that side, have had an incident, whether it's a friend, whether it's a loved one, where you have lost your lives because of speeding on our nation's roads. Mm -hmm. I want to also remind members, as I'm seeing the Minister of Sport is not here, the member for Diego Martin Central, that it was a People's Partnership government that spent a significant amount of time dealing with motor racing in Trinidad and Tobago that took motor racing off the streets and the highways of Trinidad and Tobago. That was a culture, that was a culture that the PNM allowed to foster. But Mr. Deputy Speaker, I'm hoping that the member for Diego Martin Central, that that will be a thing of the past where we will utilize that, that, that facility. I believe it is in the area of Carson Field. Um, Wallerfield, sorry, not Carson Field, Wallerfield, that we will allow to have those who enjoy that type of motorsport have a facility and not just open people partnership facilities like the Aquatic Center and the Mr. Financial Deputy Speaker, standing order 48 1. Remember, again, tighten and your initial 30 minutes is almost up. You have one more minute. I know you have been saying you are wrapping up. Do you care to extend yes, your time also? Yes, sir. All right, so proceed, but tie it up and let's bring it to a closure. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I will not just speed along, but continue to make the points that I believe will affect the, the lives of the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago as it pertains to the bill that is before the House today. And as I said, when we look at the mechanisms that has been put in place by the state, today, while we give great power to our citizens, I remind the government again that they have a responsibility, a greater responsibility. And it is in that context I raise removing from our nation's highways, the speeding, but also the drag racing. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I know that is very popular among the young people of our country. And therefore, that is why I'm advocating today as a member for Princess Song, but also as a shadow member that deals with sport and youth affairs that look into these areas where you can provide the recreation, where they enjoy these areas of speeding and drag racing to take it off the roads and really put it to where it belongs. And that is why I'm congratulating the partnership for having the foresight of having to do that. But I'm imploring the member for Diego Martin Central and those opposite to really to contribute their time and their effort in support of activities like those that would take it off from the motoring public. Mr. Deputy Speaker, my colleague from Faisabad asked me to raise the point that he felt that we should look at things like cordoning off the priority bus route because there are communities along the priority bus, bus routes to avoid accidents and road carnage in terms of pedestrian traffic, but also in terms of utilizing the signage and the signboards, the electric ones along the highway, so that we can institute a system that is very similar to what occurs in many parts of the developed world where you see on, the, on the, 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 the banners where they identify, where they identify that there are accidents ahead or that there's traffic ahead. Mr. Deputy Speaker, with those few words, I thank you for the opportunity to be able to contribute today. But while, <laughs> while Mr. Deputy Speaker, I give my thanks. While Mr. Deputy Speaker, I give my thanks However, Silence. I come back to the fundamental point, Silence. the fundamental point of the entire debate today, and that is government must not feel that they have done the population a favor. It is because of, of the measures that you took that today that you had to come and remedy the situation because of the frustration and so on that was occurring on the nation's roadways. But I want to also say to you that the greater responsibility and power lies with you, the government. You are given the power to the people in their hands in terms of increasing the speed limit. But now the onus is on you to accept responsibility for mechanisms that will be put in place to further reduce the road carnage, but also to bring about greater awareness to the motoring public of Trinidad and Tobago. With that, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I thank you. Um, Attorney General, before I recognize the Attorney General, I'd like to deal with the procedural motion for the sitting going beyond 8 p.m. According to standing order 15.5. I call the Leader of the House. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. De Mr. Deputy Speaker, in accordance with standing order 15.5, I beg to move that the House continue to sit.
until the completion of this bill. Honorable members, the question is that the House continue to sit until the completion of this bill. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the eyes have it. We'll continue to the business and I recognize the Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I rise to bring conclusion to the work at hand in wrapping up this bill and I'd like to offer um, sincere thanks to the members that have spoken today on both sides of the House. Um, a lot of the material presented was sincere. There was some excellent research. Um, I think that uh, we have reflected well as a parliament on the work, as I welcome you, Madam Speaker, to the chair, that we have reflected well on the material at hand. Madam Speaker, um, Tabakit um, raised a very uh, important issue and he said that he had made a call across to the works division um, asking for statistical information and therefore put an inquiry as to what state of completion we were actually in in terms of the work completed for the operationalization of the motor vehicle and road traffic amendments that we did on the last occasion. Similarly, um, Mayaro asked the question, where did the speed come from? And he interrogated quite properly the data that stands behind a move such as this. Indeed, Princess Town reflected similarly on that, um, on that ground. The fact is that Tabaki put it really well. He put it in the context, the Honorable Member, of whether this is a popular decision or is it devoid from the facts because one ought to be careful about making a decision which is popular um, and not fact-driven. And I thank the Honorable Members for that. Um, therefore, it is incumbent to speak to where the speed came from. It is incumbent to put onto the record the nature of the material that was traversed by the engineering um, experts at the Ministry of Works and Transport. And I wish to assure honorable members that it is well and truly data driven. I can say, Tabaki, that there are 1,016,265 registered vehicles in Trinidad and Tobago. 1,016,265 vehicles. Secondly, I am able to also inform that there are 6,554, 895 driver's permits on the system. So, 654,895 driver's permits. So we, we have really a, a ratio of two to one in terms of vehicles to drivers. Again, perhaps an indication of the prosperity of this nation, but also attenuated by some of the um, ease of importation that we had in the foreign news market over the years 1997 to 2015 as we attended to points. But Mr. Deputy, sorry, Madam Speaker, what I can say is that First of all, the engineering behind this took a veil of, number one, historical data, and number two, it also took a veil of actual current data. With respect to the historical data, we did in fact use data from 2012 and 2013 involving the remote traffic microwave system. Regrettably, that system broke down in 2013 and we were not therefore able to have data that went from the period 2013 come forward. But that system really is one that allowed you to have reflection upon not only average speeds and average occupancy, but total volume and total user occupation for bringing to life data which suggests changes in the high occupancy vehicle lane that, that we see in other jurisdictions, etc. The spot speeds which were done to anchor the current data were done across the major highways. And the spot speeds were done, again, reflective of volume, um, utilization. But it was done across a spectrum, looking for low rates of tra uh, velocity and, and high rates as well. They also were done at the various times of day. And the traffic analysis and volume analysis by the ministry was actually quite impressive. It not only demonstrated what maximum and peak hour um, traffic uh, speeds look like, but it also looked at the opportunities to go beyond the, the speed limit as prescribed 
which are the hours that are more dangerous, which are not, where is it that people actually find themselves heavy-footed, as Princess Town put it a little while ago. And suffice it to say that the range of traffic flow really is driven by the utilization of daylight hours and working conditions. As our major arteries become clogged, obviously the velocity is, is reduced. Um, as we go into the late night and early morning period, we also see that there is a, a, a speed up. Now, what I can say with certainty is that the Churchill-Roosevelt Highway, the Beetham Highway, the Uriah Butler Highway, the Sir Solomon Ho Choi Highway, those are all engineered in per lane activity to host 1,300 vehicles per lane, per hour. That is also the metric that is now associated with road user conditions. Now, we've been reflecting upon the barriers, and the um, cable barriers in particular, and the New Jersey system of um, management. It's not actually concrete with plastic over it, but it's, it's plastic with water in it. Um, and that's a, the New Jersey barrier system that you see often in the movies where you see a car colliding with something and um, they are, are met with these barriers that collapse and water goes everywhere. But the point is, this um, data utilization marries in with improvements to the carriageways. And the engineering division was very careful to look at these metrics. In managing it, they obviously referred to the international standards. We looked to the width of the highways. We looked to the markers on the highways. And I'd like to, on the position of thermal markers or um, delineation of the roadways, I want to pay an, another glowing compliment to the Ministry of Works and Transport. Because they have managed in an eight-month period to do on an in-house basis 70% of the markings of all of Trinidad and Tobago. And that is no mean feat. That throws a spanner into the works of people who believe that the public service is broken everywhere. Because there are divisions of excellence, such as that division that I've just referred to, that have managed in an eight-month period to do this kind of work, which redounds again to people's safety. Because we're not just talking about speed, we're talking about <coughs> lives, as so many members have quite eloquently put it. That's to be met as well with the further analysis conducted. Because what the engineering division did in looking at road width, in looking at potholes as it was raised by Tabakit, a very important point, um, looking at lighting conditions, looking at railways and barriers, looking at the curve um, of, of, of roads as they move uh, when you're dealing with centrifugal or centripetal forces as they uh, act upon the velocity of a car as it's moving. When you look at all of these things, the work went even further. It went further down to the rampways, the exits uh, along our major roads and our secondary roads. And in fact, people will walk away from this debate thinking that we're talking about just 100 kilometers or we're talking about 50 kilometers. 50 in built-up areas, 100 kilometers. But we're not just thinking about that. In fact, in the orders to be um, issued, we're talking about 40 kilometers at interchanges and ramps. We're talking about 30 kilometers, for instance, at the Churchill Roosevelt Highway frontage south road. We're talking about five kilometers, 20 kilometers, depending upon which area of the inner roads you're going to be driving on. And that falls under the rubric of the special order, the special speeds that we deal with. So there is definitely a matrix at work. There is the second schedule of the parent law, which prescribes the 100, the 65, the 50. There is, there is also the special speeds, which um, relate to specific areas and specific roads, like ramps, etc., and then secondary roads. So the delineation of speeds have been very, very careful. We have in San Fernando, as you know, that very crazy interchange um, that really is mind-boggling depending upon which direction you're coming from. And you can miss a turn, find yourself on a barrier. I mean, those speeds are reduced to bare minimum speeds at that. So there really was a very scientific and careful approach to the delineation of speeds per road, which is why it took us so long to not go with a popular request. We actually went with a fact-driven, data-driven request because the data in summary demonstrates that the average speed that is used 
by, um, by persons when they can get away with it is about 125, 130. There are, there are certainly much slower speeds, but our roads are designed, the major arteryways where we prescribe the 100 kilometers per hour, they're actually designed for 125 kilometers per hour. And therefore, we've used this metric of 125 as, as design capacity versus 100 in the actual prescribed capacity. And therefore, it was a very scientific approach in arriving at this um, particular decision. And again, this redounds to the expertise of the Ministry of Works and Transport and the engineering aspects, because they also reference, in particular, the international handbooks on this basis. Now, Mr. Madam Speaker, there are a few other points raised by my learned colleagues, um, and permit me just to touch upon them, because th there were some very important points. On the issue of statistics and the support for entities such as Arrive Alive, etc., there is definitely immense value in public-private operation, because a government can say all it wants if the population is not buying into the messaging, and if the population doesn't have advocates from the population other than government or, or technocratic arms speaking, then you're really talking to yourself. You're legislating for yourself. I found the following statistics quite interesting. If you look to the statistics of fatalities, it's 76% men. It's 24% women. If you look to the age brackets, 15 to 24, 16%. Shogwana Sis mentioned it, but I want to re repeat it. 25 to 34, 23%. 35 to 45, a drop down to 9. 45 to 54, back up to 17. So you're seeing those who still think they're young past actual youth in the 45 to 54 at 17%. And those who are properly young in the 17 to 24 bracket at 16%. Where those metrics sort of match up. So... Now that we've had that serious intervention by Coover South, a little levity is good for the souls, I thank you. Um, when we look to these statistics, we realize that this thing isn't only the phenomenon of the youth. And therefore, we're not really just looking out for youthful drivers. Now, Tabakit raised a very important point about the supervision of young drivers. I'm very pleased to say that the insurance companies, by way of practice, do not give insurance certificates to young drivers unless they have matriculated through a defensive driving course. And that's a step in the right direction. Secondly, we do know that several pieces of block law tried to give this 17-year-old prescriptive um, supervision, the mentoring as it was put during the course of the debate. That's something that's certainly under view as we go through this thing in the layered approach that we're, that we're dealing with. I'm really very happy for Tobago in particular, because Tobago suffered with this built-up area phenomenon for the whole island. And therefore, with Tobago having the highways prescribed as, it, as they have, it really was an injustice to have the speed limit at 50 enforced throughout the island of Tobago, and I welcome them into the realm of equality. The, the position with respect to data having been put out, I'd like to say that in the recommendations put out by Princess Town that we look to other jurisdictions and understand how we change culture and reflecting upon our goals and ideals. Respectfully, what was really missing in Trinidad and Tobago was the actual data. And therefore, the priority for the Ministry of Works and Transport has been collect the data. After you collect the data, test your data, and then put your data into utilization. And I'm very pleased to say Shaguanas East I believe it was Shagwana Sisu who raised it, Madam Speaker. The question was asked, when have you seen in Trinidad and Tobago, like you see in the United States on the movies, a car pulls you over and your data comes up on the computer system? Well, you're going to see that very soon. Because by April 2018, we anticipate that we will have gone live. We have worked out all of the steps for operationalization of this law down to the interaction of technology between the judiciary, the traffic enforcement center, the hub that will issue the, the um, citation notices, the TT post that will issue the points. So we have spent, and the technocrats are here from the Ministry of Works and Transport, and again I take my hat off to them, because when you crack that door and you go to the meeting, 
you're actually sitting down in a room of at least 30 people, all dialed in on the same page, talking the same language about bringing law to life with operationalization. And that's why it is such a sincere pleasure to take the law in the manner in which we're doing, which is in a phased approach. We were waiting in analysis paralysis for perfect laws, which were all encompassing, and it just made common sense, practical approach to actually take it in stages. I heard uh, Princess Town speak about the introduction of the speed guns. I will remind Trinidad and Tobago that as of today, legal notice number 142 takes effect. We have nine new speed guns authorized by way of order pursuant to the legislation, section 62A onward, if my memory serves me right. And those guns that actually come in right now are the LIDAR guns. So that means from six, you add another nine more. So I'm telling motorists to beware. The enforcement of this actual um, repertoire is going to be improved by something which will come to Parliament shortly, and that is the spot speed law. See, we took the first pass in the guns, and Princess Town was right. Yes, um, the, the, the amendments were made in the period 2010 to 2015, and I take my hat off to it. We supported it in a wholesome way, if you recall. They're not too far different from the radical changes which Minister Imbert, as Minister then of Works and Transport, had in dealing with the introduction of seat belts and more particularly the breathalyzer. Because the breathalyzer is the instrument that has radically transformed our driving. And for the record, Minister Young tells me he, as a minister, was breathalyzed. I have been breathalyzed as well. And I compliment the police. It was just that on a... That was before election. That was before election, sorry. But what they did was to stop and treat with it. The, no, they, 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 they still enforce the law to all. The law knows no barrier. So in, in treating with the introduction of the technology, in treating with the new um, law which we intend to bring, which is the spot speed measure, that spot speed is going to be the one on each lamppost at various areas coming through Trinidad and Tobago, which will allow us to enforce the law. So taking the, the, very, the very position that Mayaro offered and Shaguanas he's offered, it's not that we're putting more police onto the road. We're putting better technology in a functional system onto the road. And yes, we do have a better ratio and, and, and operation for the police, because don't forget, we are adding 1,000 municipal police, many of whom are being hired up as we speak into the municipal corporations, and we've redeployed the TTPS in a very different fashion. So the enforcement aspect on top of data is well in gear, and very importantly, in dealing with the corruption issue, it is the elimination of cash. It is the better systemization of facilities that will begin to take the scourge out of this. Tabakit raised something. He said in a personal experience, he was asked for $700 to make the problem go away. Yeah. Imagine this. There are 10,000 cars licensed per month. 10,000 cars licensed per month. There are 12 months in the year. When you take that, 120,000, and you average it out to the anecdotal bribe of $500 for, to get your licensing registered copy in gear, and you think to yourself, yeah, nothing wrong, I'll pay my $500, I'll get out of there fast, um, I can't wait in this line. For that particular man who is engaged, or those people who are engaged in that small $500, it's $60 million in bribery a year in one aspect of it. Tax-free. Tax-free. And the point is that this is the very reason why you need to go cashless and why you have to have your systems in place. The spot speed is going to be met. No, it doesn't. But when you systemize the printing, when you go for the decentralization, because we are decentralizing, using, using the TT Post print-off system, using the hub transit um, delivery, we are decentralizing all of these aspects. But the backbone of data had to be put into place. I want to say this as well. That data doesn't only go to licensing. That data is in the TTPS and in the National Operations Center. So that the police have real-time ability. When you layer on spot speed and next in line RFID tags, you're now talking about layering an approach to change culture in Trinidad and Tobago. 
The, yes, well, the billboards and the LED, two e essential points done, the LED billboards and the flashing lights. Those are, in fact, matters of planning and enforcement. But in an area where there is so much to be fixed, if you were to try and think of every single patch that you can do immediately, you'll never get the job done. And most respectfully, I think that taking it in the manner in which the government is doing right now, which is taking every win whenever you try to get the chance and just layering it up, it resembles the journey in moving from white belt to black belt. You don't get a black belt in martial arts the first day you join. You go through the ranks. White, yellow, orange, green, purple, purple, brown, 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 black. And those are the stages that you go through. Because there, there, there is a measured approach to this aspect. Um, Madam Speaker, a very important point was raised in respect of reflections on the Victim Compensation Fund. There is a significant fund which is built upon the back of contributions coming from insurance companies and other places, meant to compensate persons who are uninsured, etc. In fact, there's active litigation on that right now, which is a, a very good and useful tool because it allows you to work out the process for something that was not operationalized for such a very long period of time. Um, we're coming now um, to the quick end, Madam Speaker. What I will say is that the utilization of opportunities like this to take a phased approach to the law is really the mechanism to take even though we could have waited to join spot speed or join the other reforms that we're doing we felt that it was high time that this is um, dealt with now data driven statistically driven engineered operationalization going on at the same time education is part of the rollout plan and um, advocacy. So it wasn't as Princess Town put it that the Minister of Works and Transport, who's a very hardworking man, was showing up on television. It is that ministry that has been driving the process and taking lead in the way it has. We still have the Senate to go. Ma Madam Speaker, permit me to join in the reflections about the impact of speeds and death. I lost a beautiful, loving little brother, a cousin of mine, my first cousin, very much like my brother, to an accident on the highway. He was visiting from France, his father's French, his mother's my mother's sister, came for carnival, driving on the highway, and a car came across and killed him in his 20s. I remember getting the news of his death. I had him as a little boy in my arms, my little cousin, my dear beloved cousin, I remember that vividly, watching this lifeless body in my arms. That was just a couple of years ago. I have a twin sister. My first year in practice, you know they say twins have bonds. I remember being ripped out of my sleep one night. It was a Friday night. We had rate utility increased hearings on a Saturday morning, so we were working all night Friday and we would sit in court in the rate utility increases on the Saturday. And I remember I was too tired to drive back to San Fernando. I spent the night by my uncle's home. And at 2 o'clock in the morning, I jumped out of my sleep. 15 minutes later, my uncle enters the room and says, I said, what happened to her? He didn't even have to tell me. When I passed down the highway on my way to San Fernando General Hospital, and I saw the carnage of the car that my sister was in. She had actually, she's, thank God she's alive and well after 13 reconstructive surgeries. But I remember having to give her blood that night. Three pints straight. I have O negative blood. There was no other blood donor and I had to give it. And I remember collapsing off of the blood transfusion. But I remember the doctors that night intent on amputating both legs because it was so severe uh, an injury. So it isn't that these things are lost upon us. This is not publicity. This is not something which is heartfelt and all of us have not experienced. These are things which anchor into your soul, which is why we are so adamant on taking powerful but simple techniques to advance the reform of the culture of Trinidad and Tobago. 
And I'm very, very pleased that honorable members today have joined in a chorus of support for this measure. It's refreshing to come to our parliament and to do work this way. I accept that we have two swords length distance and we'll have our disputes, etc. I am not in any way um, in, 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 a, in a difficulty with the cut and thrust of politics. C'est la vie. But on today's occasion, Madam Speaker, with the ability to actually perform good work for Trinidad and Tobago, I ask honorable members for their full support, which has already been expressed, and I beg to move. Honorable members, the question is that a bill entitled An Act to Amend the Motor Vehicles and Road Traffic Act, Chapter 4850, be now read a second time. All in favor say aye. aye. Any against? The ayes have it. A bill entitled An Act to Amend the Motor Vehicles and Road Traffic Act, Chapter 4850. Attorney General. Madam Speaker, in accordance with Standing Order 68-1, I beg to move that the Motor Vehicles and Road Traffic Amendment Number 2, Bill 2017, be committed to the Committee of the Whole. Honorable <laughs> Members, the question is that the Motor Vehicles and Road Traffic Amendment Number 2, Bill 2017, be committed to the Committee of the Whole. All in favor say aye. aye. Any against? The ayes have it. This House will now go into the Committee of the Whole to consider the bill close by close. Okay, members, uh, I don't think we have notice of any amendments. So can we do all the closes together? Madam Speaker, the technocratic team has just raised a very simple but um, necessary uh, adjustment to the bill. And so if it should please you, um, there is one small adjustment to be made to the bill, which I would happily explain if you permit me. Okay, so um, could we start and could we call the closes then? Should it please one? you, ma'am? Yes. Thank you. Close one. The question is that close one stand part of the bill. The question is that close one now start stand part of the bill. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Close one now stands part of the bill. Close two. The question is that close two stand part of the bill. Madam Continue Chair, down. should it please you? Um, at close two, B, Roman five, there is the recommendation in the bill that we treat with 65 moving to 100. This applies mistakenly to the case of motor vehicles with a trailer, and that should not be the case. So we're proposing that Roman 5 be deleted so that any motor vehicle which has a strapped-on trailer to it should, in fact, continue to move at that slower speed because of the design parameters. And then we renumber Roman 6 to Roman 5, which is a consequential amendment which we don't actually have to see. Yeah? yeah? The question is that clause 2 be amended as follows to delete 2 Roman numeral 5. 
Yes, to the clause 2B, Roman numeral 5. And to renumber clause 2B, Roman numeral 6, as clause 2B, Roman numeral 5. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The question is that clause 2, as amended, now stand part of the bill. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Honorable members, the question is that the bill, as amended, be now reported to the House. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. General. Madam Speaker, I wish to report that the Motor Vehicles and Road Traffic Amendment No. 2, Bill 2017, was considered in Committee of the Whole and approved with amendments. I now beg to move that the House agree with the Committee's report. Honourable Members, the question is that this House agree with the Committee's report on the Motor Vehicles and Road Traffic Amendment No. 2, Bill 2017. All in favour say aye. Aye. Any against? The ayes have it. Attorney General. Madam Speaker, I beg to move that a bill entitled An Act to Amend the Motor Vehicles and Road Traffic Act, Chapter 4850, be forthwith read a third time and passed. Honorable Members, the question is that a bill entitled An Act to Amend the Motor Vehicles and Road Traffic Act, Chapter 5850, ch Chapter 4850, sorry, be now read a third time and passed. All in favor say aye. aye. Any against? The ayes have it. A bill entitled An Act to Amend the Motor Vehicles and Road Traffic Act, Chapter 4850. Leader of the House. Madam Speaker, I beg to move that this House do now. Yeah, be now adjourned. Be now adjourned to the. 24th of November, next week, Friday, at 1.30 p.m. That's private members, then. Honorable members, I just wish to advise that the, matter, the, the motion on the adjournment has been um, withdrawn. Honorable members, the question is that this House do now adjourn to Friday, the 24th of November, 2017, at 1.30 p.m. All in favor say aye. Any against? The ayes have it. This house now stands adjourned to Friday, the 24th of November, 2017, at 1.30 p.m. <laughs>